Televisia PN Night after night, television brought images of death and suffering from the war that engulfed Yugoslavia between 1991 and 1995. When the fighting stopped, NATO countries, particularly the United States, eagerly claimed credit for ending the war. The lesson learned, many said, was that there should be early intervention in ethnic conflicts, and preferably by NATO. But did the West prematurely take credit for ending a war it had helped create? Did misguided Western intervention actually transform a small brush fire in the Balkans into a major civil war? I think that what the international community on the whole, the Europeans and the Americans and the United Nations have done, on the whole, made it sure that there was going to be a conflict. The intelligence community was unanimous in saying that if we go ahead and recognize Bosnia, it will blow up. Because there was no agreed branches and because uh, everybody was armed, if you ruptured the old Yugoslavia by unilaterally declaring independence, in fact, seceding, it was a war of secession, once you decided to secede, you had no hope that it could be done peacefully. Early 1990 had brought a brief moment of hope and optimism to Europe as the Berlin Wall crumbled and the Cold War ground to a halt. A newly united Germany stood poised to unite the rest of Europe through its leadership of the European community, a friendly but powerful rival to the United States. But the promise of European unity was short-lived. Just two years later, much of Yugoslavia was in flames. A small war in the Slovenian Republic led to larger, more bloody conflicts in Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Moreover, European nations, the United States, and Middle Eastern states were backing different factions in these outbreaks of civil war. Publicly, Western diplomats blamed irresponsible ethnic leaders of the different Yugoslav republics for the bloodshed, including Milan Kuchan of Slovenia, Franjo Tuđman of Croatia, and especially Slobodan Milosevic of Serbia. There were certainly no innocents among the warring parties. Privately, however, European Community Envoy Lord Carrington and UN mediator Cyrus Vance were furious at Germany's Foreign Minister Hans-Dietrich Genscher. Vance would later call the conflict Mr. Genscher's War because of Germany's push to recognize separatists in Slovenia and Croatia. Vance argued that, that recognition would take away the, the diplomatic leverage that he had to try to bring the the conflict in, in Croatia to an end and, and, and uh, could possibly result in Bosnia blowing up. The former German foreign minister claimed that his government did not support the breakup of Yugoslavia until fighting began. We held a strong position for the unity of Yugoslavia, as I said, but we saw that the will to keep it together vanished more and more under the pressure of military events. In fact, however, since the 1960s, Germany's intelligence arm, the BND, was deeply involved in the training of Croatian separatists, led by the pro-Nazi Ustashi who fled to Germany after World War II and participated in a number of terrorist actions against embassies and the government of Yugoslav communist leader Josef Broz Tito. In the early 60s, the BND decided to cooperate fully with the Ustasha. This became plain to see after the so-called Croat Spring in the beginning of the 70s. After Tito's death, they accelerated their efforts together with the Ustasha in order to disintegrate Yugoslavia into several smaller states. Germany's crucial role in supporting Croatian separatists is confirmed by Anton Duhacek, the former director of Yugoslav counterintelligence, who was himself a Croat. 
The Germans wanted an absolute and complete subordination of Croatian intelligence that would carry out all that the Germans wanted. And the Germans promised that this would be in the interest of the future independent free Croatia. On the surface, Yugoslavia seemed better off than its East European neighbors in the 1970s and 80s. The U.S. considered its independent communist leader, Josip Broz Tito, an asset in the Cold War with Moscow. Yugoslavia's economy was propped up with Western loans even after Tito's death in 1980. The carefully staged 1984 Olympics in Sarajevo offered the world the impression of a peaceful multi-ethnic country working together. Veteran observers, however, could see trouble below the surface. Uh, I think the first hint I got of a violent breakup was when I made a tour of all of the republics in 1983, and I heard a lot of sort of separatist sentiments uh, in several of the republics, especially Slovenia and Croatia, but not only. And uh, some very uh, threatening remarks were made in the course of my conversations about what we would do to them and so on. By themselves, neither Slovenia nor Croatia had the diplomatic or military power to actually separate, to challenge Yugoslavia's federal army, which was the fourth largest in Europe. But Germany provided not only diplomatic support, but also weapons, even after an international arms embargo. And I wrote a story about it, which was called The Blockade's a Joke. Uh, and so I went and started checking the ports, uh, like uh, Split and, and uh, the ports along the, the Dalmatian coast, and, uh, uh, and as best I could checking the stuff that was coming across the borders. And uh, there was no limitation. We, we saw the Croatian MiG-21 shot down in the Kraina, uh, which the Croatians said came from uh, former Yugoslav Air Force stocks. In fact, it was clearly from East German Air Force stocks. It had the, the East German radar warning receivers on board. So we know that, that these weapons are coming from the uh, former uh, East German stocks so that they're, if you like, slightly disguised uh, in, in the sense that they don't look like West German weapons. But they are coming from West Germany, obviously with the West German government's blessing. There can be no other way in which heavy weapons can be supplied like this. While separatist forces were being armed, Germany was, at the same time, warning the Yugoslav government of Ante Markovic not to use force against separatists. Ante Markovic, who was himself a Croatian, presided over a divided government which was unable to stand up to German pressure or rally his government for the challenges ahead. Uh, he never lined up, you know, coalition support. Uh, he always uh, flew solo. So, you know, he could be welcomed in the White House and was, uh, but he didn't have any backing at home. So in that sense, he was a real failure and a disastrous one in that he preserved the fiction that Yugoslavia was holding together. The Yugoslav Federal Army, which held the country together, now became a target for those who wanted to break it apart. At a Croatian separatist rally in Split in May of 1991, Demonstrators strangled a young soldier of the Federal Army and then tossed his dead body onto the street. This and similar events seem to bear out predictions by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA said in 1990, October, that Yugoslavia faced breakup, probably violent, uh, as early as six months from the time of the report. And nobody paid any attention to it in the higher echelons of government. By June of 1991, however, U.S. Secretary of State James Baker decided to make one attempt to prevent a disaster. He flew to Belgrade, the capital of Yugoslavia, to confront leaders of the six republics. He said, don't any of you take steps that are not uh, agreed on by the others. However, Milan Kuchan and Franjo Tuđman leaders of the Slovenian and Croatian republics were confident that they could ignore the U.S. Secretary of State. They declared their independence just days later on June 25th because they could count on the support of German Foreign Minister Genscher and Austrian Foreign Minister Alois Mock. <laughs> 
the cycle of violence which would destroy Yugoslavia began when Slovene President Milan Kucan ordered his troops to seize customs posts on the Yugoslav borders with Austria and Italy and the Slovene capital of Ljubljana. Yugoslav flags were taken down and replaced with Slovenian flags. And the Slovenes thought they had a right to take down those flags. The end of an internationally recognized frontier. And uh, I don't think that the, for a moment Belgrade expected there would be violent resistance. To avoid violence, Yugoslav Army General Andrija Rasheta had phoned Milan Kuchan privately to let him know that many Yugoslav Army troops responding to this challenge of federal authority were not even carrying live ammunition. But in fact, the Slovenes had prepared themselves. They were getting a lot of encouragement from across the way, from Vienna and uh, from the Germans too. And they foresaw that they could uh, make a very big international case by having what they called a war of independence. It was nothing of the sort. German Foreign Minister Hans Dietrich Genscher flew to the Austrian border with Yugoslavia to join President Kuchan and warned the Federal Army against efforts to maintain control of federal borders. Kuchan ordered his forces to fire on Yugoslav army troops, including those who carried no live ammunition. Faced with international opposition led by Germany, Yugoslav President Markovic ordered the federal army to withdraw from Slovenia without a serious attempt to counter separatist forces. Slovene leaders conducted a masterful public relations effort. Foreign reporters were kept occupied in an underground press center with briefings that suggested that Slovene forces had defeated the fourth largest army in Europe. Journalists in the press center routinely reported as news fanciful briefings from Slovene officials on various battles, including some that had never happened. What was going on in Slovenia, where the Slovenians declared independence and set up customs posts on the road, tended to be seen and portrayed on television as the, uh, the Yugoslav army acting aggressively against Slovenia as opposed to the Slovenians declaring independence. The manipulation of the foreign press corps set the tone for new wars of secession in Croatia and Bosnia. Repeatedly, the JNA was described as an occupying force dominated by Serbs. The reality was different, however. The army's chief of staff, Veljko Kadijevic, was half Croatian, half Serb. Air Force chief Zvonko Jurjevic was Croatian, and the commander of the navy, Stane Brovet, was Slovenian. And the Federal Army had held Yugoslavia together under Tito without creating any um, um, protests about human rights. Uh, Tito insisted on an ethnic balance, and uh, in the localities it was uh, composed of the people of that area. It, it, it was absurd to call it an army of occupation. And we should have, we the West, should have recognized it until there was an agreed arrangement for a dissolution of a state which had been Yugoslavia and which might take years or decades or perhaps be impossible. Until then, it had to be recognized these were the internationally recognized frontiers. If German and Austrian leaders still believed that Slovenia and Croatia could be separated from Yugoslavia without a wider war, the Americans strongly believed otherwise. Because we said, if Yugoslavia does not break up peacefully, there's going to be one hell of a civil war. Uh, it nevertheless broke up uh, non-peacefully. It broke up through the unilateral declaration of independence by Slovenia and Croatia and the seizing by these two countries, uh, republics, of their border posts, which was an act of force and which was an act that was in violation of the Helsinki uh, principles. Uh, but the European powers and the United States ultimately recognized Slovenia and then Croatia and then Bosnia as independent countries as member and, and admitted them to the United Nations. The real problem was that there was a unilateral declaration of independence and a use of force uh, to gain that independence rather than a peaceful uh, negotiation of independence, which is the way it should have happened. While most of Europe, including England, France, and Russia, opposed the breakup of Yugoslavia, only the Americans were strong enough to oppose Germany. In a decision that would have far-reaching consequences, however, 
the Americans decided to back away from this challenge. George Kenney, who would later resign in protest over policy, was running the U.S. State Department's Yugoslavia desk at the time. Our, our marching orders were, were to keep the U.S. out, to, to, to um, avoid taking any responsibility for a solution to the conflict. The analysts could see that the problem would get a lot worse. They also saw that the Europeans weren't going to be able to handle it. Historically, the United States had supported a multi-ethnic Yugoslavia over a 70-year period to stabilize the region and serve as a barrier to German expansion. In reality, Yugoslavia, a union of South Slavic peoples, would never have come together in 1918 without American support from U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. For centuries, the region had been colonized by Austro-Hungary and the Turkish Ottoman Empire. The Austrians, under the Habsburg monarchy, used a policy of divide and rule to maintain control, keeping the Slovenes, Croatians, Serbs, and Muslims at each other's throats instead of uniting them in their common interests. The Habsburg Empire kept going and held down a large part of what we came to call Yugoslavia. Um, and uh, there was no possibility of a Slav get together until after the First World War when the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed and the peoples came together and decided to unite. With American support, Yugoslavia was founded in 1918 and survived German attempts to divide it up during World War II. When Yugoslavia's communist leader, Josef Broz Tito, broke away from the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc in 1948, the U.S. stepped in with military assistance, as well as international loans, to prop up a buffer state between the West and the communist-dominated Warsaw Pact. As the Cold War came to an end, however, Washington declared a new world order which emphasized economic competition rather than anti-communism. So once that containment of the Soviet Union began to disappear as a need with the decline in after mid-80s, Gorbachev's economic reforms, the NATO Warsaw Pact talks about reducing arms and, and force buildup, all of that led to Yugoslavia being essentially irrelevant in its defense posture. And by early 1989, the Americans were really quite explicit. The ambassador, new ambassador to Yugoslavia from the United States, informed the Yugoslav government that the Yugoslav position was no longer needed, that it was no longer, Yugoslavia was no longer strategically important to the United States and Western defense. Yugoslavia had become expendable. International loans were called in, causing triple-digit inflation. The federal government was forced to require austerity measures from the different republics. Particularly those requirements led Slovenia as a republic and eventually other republics to rebel against what was being called economic reform in the constitutional level. Any American efforts to preserve Yugoslavia would also put Washington on a collision course with Germany when German leaders were enjoying their first taste of real political power since World War II. Moreover, U.S. President George Bush had declared a special relationship with Germany, the kind America used to have with England. The United States thought that Germany would have to be largely responsible for the incorporation of Eastern Europe and Central Europe into the West because Germany was, had a national interest, it was its neighbor, its periphery, and it was financially the most powerful country in Europe and had the resources to do it. In the post-Cold War period, Germany wanted once again, the evidence is very clear, to recolonize Yugoslavia, to recolonize the Balkans. And the United States tied itself to German policy through its need of German power and influence in stabilizing Eastern Europe, Western Europe, through the exercise of dominion via the European community, now the European Union, and potentially, eventually, in the former lands, uh, in the lands of the former Soviet Union. The problem was that there was one very important country standing in the way of this, and that was Yugoslavia. While citizens of Croatia were initially divided over whether to remain in Yugoslavia, the separatists were led by the most extreme elements, remnants of the pro-Nazi Ustasha.
As the New York Times columnist A.M. Rosenthal would write, in World War II, Hitler had no executioners more willing, no ally more passionate than the fascists of Croatia. They are returning from 50 years ago from what should have been their eternal grave, the defeat of Nazi Germany. Adolf Hitler considered Yugoslavia to be an artificial creation of the hated Versailles Treaty, which ended World War I. To break it up, he set up a puppet state, an enlarged Croatia, which also included Bosnia-Herzegovina. As its leader, he appointed the fanatical Croat Ustashi Ante Pavlic. Pavlic had helped plot the assassination of King Alexander, Yugoslavia's first constitutional monarch, in Marseille, France, in 1934. And it was the Germans, the German Nazis, who picked up this dreadful um, uh, Ustasi leader, uh, who had made quite clear that he favoured Hitler's solution to be applied, which Hitler's his final solution for the Jews, he wanted to apply to the Serbs, so he made no secret of it. Simon Wiesenthal, who tracked Ustasi fugitives for decades, along with other Nazi war criminals, told an interviewer, I must admit, I am obsessed by the criminal character of the independent state of Croatia. Even the Germans were appalled by the crimes committed in it. How many men, women and children died there? Hitler's special envoy to the Balkans, Hermann Neubacher, wrote, Leaders of the Ustashi boast that they have slaughtered one million Orthodox Serbs. On the basis of official German reports, I estimate the number to be three quarters of a million. Most of these Serbian civilians perished in the notorious Croatian death camp Jasenovac, which straddled the Sava River between Croatia and Bosnia. The extermination of Serbs, Jews and Gypsies in Sarajevo was the task of top Muslim leaders who, with few exceptions, collaborated with Hitler and the Croatians. There was in occupied Bosnia, also under German patronage, a strong uh, Muslim wing which was uh, very anti-Western. Uh, it was represented uh, internationally by the Mufti of Jerusalem. You heard of his viciously anti-Western views, and he was brought to Sarajevo and mobbed by enthusiastic crowds. After the war ended, Croatia and Bosnia were never denazified. Not only were there no apologies to the Serbs, Jews, and Gypsies, but attitudes remained frozen under the surface of Tito's official policy of socialist fraternity amongst peoples. Following the death of Yugoslavia's longtime leader, Tito, in 1980, right-wing emigre organizations took out an advertisement on the opinion page of the New York Times, stating that Yugoslavia would not survive, and offering a map which included all of Bosnia as part of Croatia. It was a map nearly identical to the Nazi-created independent state of Croatia. By 1990, as communism was collapsing in Eastern Europe, Croatian separatists pinned their hopes on a former communist general named Franjo Tuđman, who had been jailed for excessive nationalism by Tito in the 1970s. You know, I met him very soon after he came out of communist jail, while uh, Tito was still alive. He had then championed the uh, racialist nationalist form of nationalism, and uh, when he came out of prison, instead of doing what you would think a dissident would do and say to hell with the communists. He said, oh, well, what have to do with the regime? It says horrible Serbs who are oppressing us and the Serbs are responsible for everything and the Serbs are guilty and the Serbs have done it all. Tujman received important help from outside of Croatia in his rise to power. The German Secret Service was enormously active in Croatia and in all of Yugoslavia, trying in the 80s to build bridges between what were called the national communists, Stipe Mesic, Franjo Tuđman, in Yugoslavia, and the Ustasha revanchist organizations which lived in the diaspora of uh, Croatia, that is to say all of the people of weight and influence who had fled uh, the former Nazi puppet state in 1945. Tuđman found it useful to make come to terms with them, and, and because he was running on this xenophobic platform, there was really no difficulty about it. What was difficult was when he was trying to sell his cause in the West, and he managed to, partly because he had a very good lobby, 
very effective and much more effective than the Serbian lobby and uh, partly because he covered up his intentions. Tujman often embarrassed his most important supporters, such as German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. For instance, Tujman had written a book minimizing the crimes of the Ustashi and claiming that the Holocaust was greatly exaggerated. Thank God my wife is neither a Serb nor a Jew, he told one interviewer. For the national flag, Tujman chose a replica of the checkerboard emblem that flew over the Croatian death camps of World War II, where Serbs, Jews, and Gypsies were exterminated. Tujman's anti-Semitic views were covered beneath rhetoric acceptable to the West. With the help of Ruder and Finn, a high-powered American public relations firm, the New York Times found space for General Tujman's new and misleading image on its opinion page. In the article, Tujman promised that there would be no purges against the Serbian population in Croatia if it separated from Yugoslavia. Tujman declared that Croatia was for the Croats. That was his slogan, a racialist slogan. Croatia for the Croats, with the implication people who weren't Croats, and there was a very substantial Serb and Yugoslav mixed variety, um, didn't feel that they had any, they were in fact second class citizens, and he recognized them as such. A full six months before fighting broke out, Serbs were purged from positions in government, news organizations, and the police. Their homes were dynamited in cities such as Zagreb, Zadar, and Dubrovnik. For the first time since World War II, Serbs in eastern Croatia began to flee across the Danube River. The Serbs working in Croatian cities were required to sign loyalty oaths. Those who did not sign were fired. Those who did sign were fired, fired later. Uh, Serb homes, apartments, and businesses were attacked. Any doubt that Tujman himself issued orders for the expulsion of Serbs in Croatia was removed by Tomislav Merchep, a senior member of Tujman's ruling party, the HDZ. Merchep would later be identified by Croatian police reports as one of two Croatian leaders who directed death squads that murdered hundreds of Serbian civilians in eastern Slavonia around Vukovar and Osijek in the fall of 1991. He received little press coverage in the West, but Merchep was, in many ways, the spark that set the fire of war in Slavonia, a disputed region of Croatia where the Yugoslav war began. Merchep's co-leader of the Croatian death squads was Branimir Glavash of Osijek. Unlike more discreet members of the ruling HDZ party, Glavaš made no secret of his identification with the World War II Croatian Ustaši as he welcomed returning Croatian prisoners of war. While some French intellectuals were hailing Croatia as part of the new Europe, old and familiar forces were at work. Osijek became a magnet for neo-fascist groups fighting with Glavaš. They included British skinheads, German and Austrian neo-fascists, and followers of the French extremist Jean-Marie Le Pen. C'est comme ça que l'on bâtit l'Europe nationaliste. Et uh, vous y allez directement après, demain... Uh... Oui, de, demain, nous partons pour uh, Zagreb pour prendre des ordres à l'état-major, mais pas de l'armée la, croate régulière. Nous allons, avec la force de défense croate qui dépend du parti du droit croate, et donc nous partirons quelque part sur le front en Slavonie, je suppose. The United States, which soon adopted Germany's approach to the Balkans, ignored recent history and offered a simple explanation for the fighting which broke out in the predominantly Serbian region of Croatia, which was known as the Kraina. Assistant Secretary of State Richard Holbrook, who spent the early years of the Yugoslav War as the American ambassador to Germany, represented what became the official American view. The Serbs started this war. The Serbs are the original cause of the war. Those who tried to prevent the war saw it differently. The Serbs in, uh, in Croatia, and indeed outside Croatia, had a very vivid memory of what happened in 1941-42, uh, when Hitler uh, 
uh, declared Croatia as an independent in puppet state, if you like, and the uh, horrors that went on there and, and the murders of the Serbs uh, were still very, I mean, a very large number of Serbs were murdered at that time. I mean, uh, hundreds of thousands. And um, I think it was very understandable that uh, when Croatia uh, declared its independence and promulgated a new, new constitution without any safeguard for the 600,000 Serbs who still lived in Croatia, the, the, Croatia, the, the Serbs were very perturbed about this. From the beginning, the Serbs were blamed, and they were partly blamed out of ignorance because nobody bothered to look back at the history to put it within its historical context and to see why the Serbs who lived in Kraina and the Serbs who lived uh, in, uh, in, in the area that is called Bosnia and Herzegovina, why, because of their historical experiences, were so hostile to being under uh, Zagreb or under Muslim Sarajevo rule. In World War II, Serbs offered the first serious resistance to Nazi Germany on the mainland of Europe. Later in the war, the Serbian royalists, sometimes known as the Chetniks, organized the largest rescue of downed American pilots behind enemy lines. But U.S. relations with the Serbs deteriorated greatly by 1989, symbolized by the stormy relationship between Slobodan Milosevic, the new leader of Serbia, and Warren Zimmerman, the new U.S. ambassador to Yugoslavia. I think Warren came out of Vienna from his last post as an ambassador dealing mainly with human rights. And his first action as ambassador was to go to Kosovo and embrace the Kosovo separatist leaders. Uh, and this automatically offended uh, the relatively new Serbian leadership under Slobodan Milosevic. By the late 1980s, ethnic unrest in Kosovo had already set the stage for the breakup of Yugoslavia. For Serbs, who first inhabited the area in the 7th century AD, Kosovo was the cradle of their civilization, their Jerusalem, and home to their most revered monasteries. A bit of history, unfortunately, is required here. Uh, the Albanians uh, pushed Serbs out in the 19th century. The Serbs started pushing Albanians out around 1904. Uh, the Albanians uh, surged back in World War II under Italian protection and pushed Serbs out. When the war ended, however, Marshal Tito decided to keep the Serbian refugees from returning to their homes in Kosovo. As a result, Serbs lost their majority in the province. Tito is very guilty of that particular drama of Kosovo. He made it much harder to solve, in fact, almost impossible. To keep a restive Albanian population within the Yugoslav Federation, Tito's 1974 constitution gave Kosovo autonomy as a province of Serbia. However, the autonomy was badly abused by Tito's Albanian communist cadres, who permitted a campaign of violence to drive out the remaining Serbian population. Life was made extremely difficult uh, for the Serb minority, and it was here that the Kosovos began to push to have a pure, uh, all Albania, meaning a racially pure, um, a Kosovo in the areas where uh, there were very few Serbs anyhow, they were pushing them out. And the Serbs used the word that it was ethnic cleansing and that that's what it was. Homes of Serbs were appropriated by Albanians. Orthodox Christian cemeteries and monasteries were desecrated. By the late 1980s, the Serbian population of Kosovo had gone from 50% at the start of World War II to just 10%. At this time, Slobodan Milosevic emerged as the voice of Serbian discontent over Kosovo. Seeking to consolidate his political base in his own republic, Milosevic also spoke for Serbian minorities living in Croatia and Bosnia who feared the emergence of hostile separatist regimes. A lifelong political opportunist, Milosevic was willing to provide limited military support to the Serbs of the Kraina as long as it suited his own agenda. The Serbian leader's maneuvers, however, deepened the chaos that accompanied the breakup of Yugoslavia. I think he is enormously to blame for his 
treatment of Western powers from the beginning of 1991. He regarded them as the enemy and he would not talk to them. While Serbia's president shunned meetings with the American ambassador, separatist leaders were receiving a sympathetic ear from Warren Zimmerman. The American ambassador and his boss, Assistant Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger, largely ignored the provocations of separatists in Slovenia and Croatia who were backed by Germany and focused solely on the Serbs. The two of them adopted a stance that was, from day one, blaming the Serbs for just about everything. The Serbs were the, the target of all of the actions of the United States of America from the beginning. So did American news organizations, whose foreign correspondents relied heavily on the U.S. Embassy for their reporting. Yet the obsessive focus of the press with Milosevic served to divert attention from the role of Western powers in making an avoidable war inevitable. While some Western leaders called Milosevic an architect of the conflict, the first shots of the war had been fired by armed separatists in Slovenia and Croatia, strongly supported by Germany. In hope of heading off disaster, the European community organized a constitutional conference in 1991, led by respected British diplomat Lord Peter Carrington, to find a compromise between those who wanted to separate from Yugoslavia and those who wished to keep it together. The problem was that administrative borders, or internal frontiers, devised by Tito in 1943, left one-third of the Serbian population out of Serbia, mostly in Bosnia-Herzegovina and Croatia. These frontiers were drawn in a very secretive and very, might be very irresponsible way by Tito's inner cabinet while the war was still going on. And they were never subject to a public debate or discussion. They were never endorsed. The idea of giving each republic substantial economic and political autonomy meant that each was a kind of hierarchy of the party and then there was a, you had, in order to keep the country together, you had to balance out these political leaders and Tito was very skillful in playing one off against the other or in some cases of playing them against their population. It was the substitute for democracy in the way that we know it, but it was also considered by many of his supporters throughout the population as necessary because to their view, democracy led to national, or as we call them, ethnic parties, and that would then break up the country and lead to civil war again. As Yugoslavia slid toward civil war in 1991, two referendums were held on the same day in Croatia. Croatians voted overwhelmingly to separate from Yugoslavia, while ethnic Serbs, particularly those from the Krajina region, voted by a similar margin to remain within Yugoslavia. A compromise favored by European community negotiators would have permitted Croatia to leave the Yugoslav Federation, but would have permitted the regions where Serbs formed a majority to remain in Yugoslavia or to gain substantial autonomy. Serbs who lived in an independent Croatia would be guaranteed full citizenship and human rights protections. In the capital city of Zagreb, Croatian President Tuđman seemed reluctantly prepared to accept this compromise which would have prevented a major military conflict. Germany, however, announced they would recognize both Slovenia and Croatia within Tito's administrative borders before the end of 1991. There would be no compromise. The Serbs were bitter that the first act of a newly united Germany would be to divide the Serbs of Yugoslavia into at least three separate countries. A crucial opportunity to divide Yugoslavia by peaceful means was now threatened by Germany's action. It broke up the Constitutional Conference because once you go two out of the six republics uh, independence, th those two had no further interest in the Constitutional Conference. If you had to ask the other republics whether they wanted their independence, which meant you had to ask Bosnia, and it was perfectly plain uh, that Bosnia, uh, that, well, there was going to be a civil war in Bosnia if you did do that. UN Secretary General Perez de Cuellar sent a strong letter to German leaders warning that recognition would be a disaster. Germany and Austria's own ambassadors in Belgrade privately warned against recognition of Croatia. The Germans risked being isolated. 
But the pressure from the from Cole's party and from the huge lobby of um, uh, lobby in the southern parts of Germany and Bavaria particularly was such that it was difficult for Genscher to go on uh, postponing uh, the support. By the time the war started, the German public had already been prepared by the repeated attacks on the Serbs in an influential German newspaper in Frankfurt. The strident commentary of Johann Georg Reismüller, which favored Croatia and reviled the Serbs, any Serbs, all Serbs, reminded Peter Hanke of the way Nazi propaganda minister Josef Goebbels once characterized the Jewish race. It was the German press in the form par excellence of the right-wing Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and its journalists that fundamentally influenced German policy. German support for Croatian separatists received an unusual tribute, a musical thank you on Croatian state television. <laughs> Serbian television broadcast Croatia's musical thank you interspersed with World War II footage of cheering Croatian crowds in Zagreb welcoming Hitler's troops. All sides used propaganda, but Serbian propaganda was aimed at the Serbian population to bolster Milosevic's power base. By contrast, Croatian propaganda was designed to win international support. With the help of public relations firm Ruder and Finn, Croatia successfully used the media to manipulate a larger audience, particularly Germany and the U.S., to gain support for its separatist agenda. This was particularly evident in the reporting of the war around the resort town of Dubrovnik, a favorite vacation spot for German tourists. Working through its Washington PR firm, the Croatian government managed to convince much of the world that Dubrovnik was being destroyed by the Serbs in unprovoked attacks which lasted for months during the fall of 1991. The public has been led to believe that the uh, Federal Army attack on Dubrovnik was not precipitated by anything but sheer malice. However, on August 25th of 1991, Croatian forces attacked a base uh, in the Bay of Kotor, on the Bay of Kotor, and they were repulsed with heavy losses. Yugoslav troops, based in Montenegro, then fought their way up the coast, confronting Croatian forces near Dubrovnik. Targets outside the old city were hit, uh, consisting mostly of hotels, which had been uh, uh, taken over as barracks and spotter points by Croatian forces who also put refugees in the lower stories of their own barracks and spotter facilities. It was obvious that the Croats were using the old town as a defensive wall. They were firing from behind hospitals. They had a mortar position next to our hotel. The final straw for me was when there was this incredible bombardment in our hotel basement. Bang, 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 bang. The worst we had ever heard. And I was furious and everyone else was panicking. And I said to the manager who was down there with us, I said, I wish you would tell that chap with the heavy machine gun in the floor above to stop firing at the Serbs because they're going to fire back. Contrary to news reports, there was little damage to the historic old city. Yes, it has been reported to, uh, some 15,000 shells rained on the old city of Dubrovnik. I counted 15 mortar hits on the main street. The Yugoslav Federal Army could have destroyed the old city of Dubrovnik in two hours. It is not destroyed. Washington Post reporter Peter Maas, who visited the old city several months after the fighting stopped, found Dubrovnik in what he described as nearly pristine condition. There are many people who go to these uh, scenes of uh, mayhem and adventure who don't know where they are, who don't know the languages, cannot really communicate with the people, and who take press handouts from the local authorities. So there is certainly a, an orchestrated effort on the part of the Croatian and uh, the Slovenian, Austrian and German media to portray the Serbs as a bunch of howling, Byzantine, uncivilized barbarians. The facts on the ground, however, mattered little after first impressions had been made. Rather than admit that they had made a mistake, influential columnists on both sides of the Atlantic continued to write that Dubrovnik had been destroyed. Public opinion was tilted against the Serbs and towards Croatia's political goal, recognition as an independent state. 
These impressions helped strengthen Germany's resolve to lead a reluctant European community to recognize the separatist republics and thereby dismantle Yugoslavia. To overcome British opposition to recognizing Croatia, German Prime Minister Helmut Kohl offered British leader John Major a deal which left Britain free to disregard or opt out of the social provisions of the 1991 treaty creating a unified Europe, which was being hotly debated in the British Parliament. This helped John Major politically at home, but Bosnia would pay a high price. The French, who needed German help to stabilize France's currency, also dropped their opposition to recognizing the separatist republics. The United States, the only power strong enough to oppose Germany, began to waver. Deputy Secretary of State Lawrence Siegelberger, who had once served as U.S. Ambassador to Yugoslavia and spoke Serbo-Croat, knew well the dangers of a wider war if recognition were extended before a settlement had been reached between the different ethnic groups. I think the major lesson here is that when you get involved in something like this with a thousand years of history underlying it all, you need to understand that once the dam breaks, uh, the viciousness can be pretty awful on all sides. In the end, here also, peace would be sacrificed for domestic politics. There was an American election coming up. When we finally went ahead and recognized, one of the reasons we did so was because it, bec it had become a major domestic political issue for us here. We have particularly a large Croatian-American community, and Mr. Bush lost most of them in the, in the, 19, in the election that he lost because they were unhappy with our having delayed as long as we did in recognizing Croatia. While German actions encouraged the armed secession of Slovenia and Croatia, it was U.S. diplomacy, particularly through Ambassador Warren Zimmerman, which helped light the spark for a war in Bosnia-Herzegovina by supporting Muslim leader Alija Izetbegovic in his bid for a separate state. And then we were the ones that went to the Europeans uh, and insisted that the, that they recognized Bosnia and then we would recognize all three of the new states and that was a deal that was made and of course it was precisely that that led to the current war. This was a war that European leaders believe could have been avoided. The Bosnian Serbs un until comparatively recently had been in the majority in Bosnia and then the Muslims who had a very much higher birth rate than the Serbs became the predominant, uh, uh, the, the majority population. And this, of course, was something very hard for the Serbs to, uh, to swallow. And uh, they made it abundantly plain very early on that they were not prepared to accept a situation in which there was an independent Bosnia under the constitution which then prevailed. And indeed, under the constitution which then prevailed, uh, it, was not, it was illegal for Izetbegovic to declare independence because any constitutional change of that magnitude had to be agreed by all three parties. Privately, European leaders worried about Izetbegovic's close ties to Iran and the possibility of a Muslim fundamentalist state in the heart of a newly unified Europe. Izetbegovic himself had ties to the Iranians going back long before they came to power in Bosnia, really beginning not too long after the Iranian re revolution uh, came to power in uh, 1979. As armed conflict swept across Croatia in the fall of 1991, a group of Muslim moderates led by Adil Zulfi Karpashic undertook an effort to prevent similar or worse bloodshed in Bosnia by entering into negotiations with Bosnian Serbs and Serbian President Milosevic. A rather liberal-minded uh, and assimilationist Muslim, Zulfi, Zulfi Karpashic, could see that the essential was to prevent them start killing each other. And he met Serbs who had precisely the same view that this could be a disaster. And they moved quite far towards agreeing on a way of sharing power so that they wouldn't collide. Izit Begovic joined the negotiations and an agreement was ready for signing that specifically guaranteed that Bosnia would remain a unitary republic which would be given equal status to Serbia within a revamped Yugoslavia. Izid Begovic seemed to indicate his acceptance, but then abruptly broke off negotiations aimed at preventing a war. Izid Begovic did what uh, Zulfi Kapashic calls uh, a stab in the back because he went on television. <laughs>
without telling Zulfiq Pasha he's going to do this and accused Zulfiq Pasha and the Serbs who negotiated this deal of selling out and traitors to Bosnia. And this, you know, was a terribly dangerous thing to do in 91 and should have put everybody on warning against the kind of peace-loving, multi-ethnic, etc., etc., that he, he and his followers are always giving towards Western journalists and Western politicians. In his book, The Politics of Diplomacy, then Secretary of State James Baker wrote that Ambassador Zimmerman strongly advised him to recognize Bosnia. Recognition of Bosnia, however, violated the most basic diplomatic norms. For a government to be recognized, it must be in full control of its territory. It must have clearly established borders. It must also have a stable population. Not a single one of these essential conditions existed in Bosnia in February of 1992 when Zimmerman made his recommendation. U.S. intelligence analysts predicted that recognition would lead to war. Even the Germans thought that recognition of Bosnia would be a serious mistake. We did have some different opinions in early 1992 as the Americans supported the recognition of Bosnia, whereas we, the Europeans, believed that we should first establish a framework for the whole region. So basically the policymakers ignored the analysts and uh, by, by late January, early February, U.S. policy had come around to the view that, that we would recognize Bosnia and we wanted the Europeans to recognize Bosnia along with us. So from, from mid-February on we were pushing the Europeans hard to recognize Bosnia and, uh, and we were thinking about how we would do that and, and have the U.S. recognize Croatia and Slovenia at the same time. With American support, recognition of a separate Bosnian state was now inevitable. Lord Carrington tried to avert disaster by appointing Portuguese President Josi Cotillero to find common ground among the Serbs, Muslims and Croats before an independent Bosnia was recognized. I asked him to go to, uh, uh, to Sarajevo and to Lisbon and to have talks about, uh, with the three parties in Bosnia to see whether or not some agreement could become could could be reached with a unitary uh, state, I mean a state, an independent Bosnian state, but in some sort of federal idea in which you've got the three communities to agree. The Bosnian Serbs, Croats and Muslims all signed the pact known as the Lisbon Agreement on March 18, 1992. This set up a central government of Bosnia-Herzegovina and three ethnic cantons on the model of Switzerland. It was the last chance, I think, of trying to preserve uh, Bosnia before the war broke out in, in earnest. If the Lisbon plan had been adopted, British author and BBC journalist Misha Glenny wrote later, the war in Bosnia probably would not have happened. But two days after signing it, following a meeting with American Ambassador Warren Zimmerman, Izetbegovic changed his mind and disavowed his signature. Izetbegovic turned around and, and reneged. Uh, as he's reneged on other things. Zimmerman later acknowledged to David Binder of the New York Times that Izid Begovic had reluctantly signed the agreement to gain European recognition. More than a year after the bloodshed began in Bosnia, Zimmerman also admitted that the Lisbon plan was not bad at all, but recalls telling Izid Begovic, if you don't like it, why sign it? Zimmerman told Izid Begovic, look, why don't you wait and see what the U.S. can do for you, meaning we'll recognize you and then help you out. So don't go ahead with the Lisbon Agreement, uh, don't accept the Cutiero plan, and uh, uh, just, just hold out uh, uh, for some kind of unitary Bosnian state. So I, I, this is a, a, a major turning point in, in our diplomatic efforts. The American administration made it quite clear that they thought that the proposals, the Cutiero and my proposals, were unacceptable. With no agreement amongst the Muslims, Serbs and Croats, and with all sides mobilized for war, the European community voted, as the U.S. insisted, to recognize Bosnia on April 6th, along with Slovenia and Croatia. This act, Roger Cohen of the New York Times later wrote, was as close to criminal negligence as a diplomatic act can be. Indeed, international recognition and the outbreak of the Bosnian War were simultaneous the world put light to the fuse.
Both sides in Bosnia, the Serbs, Muslims, and Croats, fought for their own survival in 1992. Western countries sought political advantage by allying themselves with different factions. Outside individual countries have been playing sides and therefore escalating the nationalist competition within. A war which could have been avoided in the first place would thus be prolonged with more bloodshed, suffering, and refugees. When the fighting erupted in 1992, the UN mission in Sarajevo, known as UNPROFOR, was given the thankless task of bringing the warring parties together in some form of compromise. But the UN's attempt to be the honest broker was repeatedly undermined by the competing agendas of its own members, particularly the United States, which pressured NATO into supporting Bosnia's ruling Muslim faction, headed by Alija Izetbegovic. The United States, for reasons that are not entirely clear, has always been the very dogged champion of the uh, Izetbegovic uh, Islamic faction within Bosnia. Britain, France, and Russia had always tended towards Serbia. The Germans, of course, had always been supporter of the Croats. If the various European interests had been allowed to govern in Bosnia, I think it's very clear it would have eventually led to some sort of an arrangement between the Serbs and the Croats, which would have ended, I think, with a minimum of bloodshed. With strong support from the United States and Middle Eastern countries, however, Izet Begovic had a clear interest in prolonging the war in the hope that the West would intervene on his behalf. And I think the American support, insofar as he's had that kind of support, has been to please their, their clients in the Middle East. I think that uh, um, uh, insofar as Izet Begovic does hope to internationalize the war, which is his only chance of continuing, keeping it going, and he has an interest in, in, in keeping it going, and uh, um, I think uh, depends on continuing this Middle Eastern support. U.S. intelligence was aware that since the middle 1980s, Iran had been training 250 Bosnian Muslims each year. Iran has, has a number of strategic objectives in Bosnia. Part of that is getting an Islamic state firmly established in Western Europe. The Sarajevo regime headed by Alija Izetbegovic is a radical Islamic regime that is tied closely to the Iranians and other radical Islamic elements. You see, for example, in the person of Osama bin Laden, who is a Saudi but has been resident in Sudan, also in Afghanistan, who is uh, the international nature of this radical Islamic movement, which is very supportive of uh, the Izetbegovic regime, to which he, in fact, is a, a member, a component. But the State Department, in both the Bush administration and the incoming Clinton administration, brushed aside these concerns early in the war. It was not until 1996 that NATO leaders, worried about their own troop safety, raided terrorist training camps in Bosnia run jointly by the Iranians and the Bosnian government. It's an abomination. There are clearly terrorist uh, training activities. These weapons here, in particular this plastic child's toy with plastic explosives and a detonator inserted in it. It has direct association with people in the government. At the outset of the war, the U.S. was promoting the Sarajevo government as a multi-ethnic democracy. The Clinton posture, as is clear to any observer, has always be based, been based on two themes. So one is that the Sarajevo regime is a democratic, multi-ethnic uh, democracy. Um, and the second one is that it is the victim of aggression uh, by Serbia, tentatively by the Croats, if they get too obstreperous, but primarily by the Serbs. Long-time observers found this description of Izetbegovic's government and his SDA party misleading. The Bosnian presidency was supposed to rotate on a yearly basis, first to Serbian and then to Croatian leaders. But the fighting allowed Izetbegovic to claim emergency powers for himself and his party, the SDA. It's a wartime emergency government. I mean, by the constitution that's still technically valid in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, he should have ended his presidency in uh, December 1992. Uh, he's claiming that war, war emergency allows him to stay on, but not even that is uh, uh, ac exactly according to that constitution. Contrary to statements by the U.S. State Department, Izet Begovic rejected a multi-ethnic Bosnia in his book, The Islamic Declaration, written in 1970, where he states, 
there can be neither peace nor coexistence between the Islamic religion and non-Islamic social political systems. Is it Begovic's defenders claimed that he had modified his views, but in fact, the Islamic declaration was officially reprinted in time for the 1990 election campaign without any changes. The administration must be aware of that and their protestations about the democracy and human rights and multi-ethnicity of that uh, regime are, are, are patently absurd and they know it. Is it Begovic further identified himself with extremist views in 1990 when he gave an interview to a magazine which celebrated Muslim World War II collaboration with Nazi Germany? The cover of the magazine pictured Serbian leaders with severed heads. There are no Croats or Serbs visible in that Izetbegovic government uh, with any real authority. Uh, the Bosnian army, as it calls itself now, is mainly Muslim, Muslim manned, Muslim officered. I don't want to give you the impression that I think all the people who are fighting on Izetbegovic's side in this army are all of them uh, um, fighters of the Holy War and Muhajideen. They're not. I think that the, the, a great many of them just feel, you know, they belong in Sarajevo and they're appalled by the attacks that have had during the war against Sarajevo. And there are lots of young people who really genuinely believe they're fighting for, 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 for a, a society in which all Bosnians can live together and uh, genuinely are multi-ethnic. But, but they are right, fighting in a cause uh, which is to make Izzet Begovic president of the whole of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is not a Muslim country. It's mainly Christian, as you know. If you put the, the uh, Serb Orthodox and the Catholic Croats together, you have a majority, an absolute majority. And it's ridiculous that it should be Izzet Begovic's un, 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 under Izzet Begovic's undivided sovereignty. Instead of reaching out to potential allies and presenting their case to remain as part of Yugoslavia, the Bosnian Serbs relied on their initial advantage in weaponry to pursue a military victory. I think it's a civil war. I, I mean, I think everybody in, in what was Yugoslavia has a case of a sort. Uh, I think you can make a case out for the Serbs, you can make a case out for the Bosnians, you can make a Muslims, you can make a case out for the Croats. But the difficulty is that they all were so extravagant in what they, the, the reactions to what all the others did. The Muslims have been represented as the victims and the Serbs as the aggressors. It should be remembered, however, that the first blood shed in the struggle was Serb blood. Two Muslim gunmen and one Croat stalked a Serb Orthodox wedding party in the heart of Old Sarajevo. The father of the groom was killed, uh, the Orthodox priest was wounded. The killing of Nikola Gardovic on March 1st was a prelude to the war in Sarajevo. Despite promises from the government, the killers, who were well known, were not arrested. The following day, roadblocks were set up by both Muslims and Serbs. Unable to protect their civilian population, Serbs began to insist that predominantly Serbian areas of the city be controlled by their own police, or that Sarajevo become a UN protectorate. Muslims insisted on the Izetbegovic government's right to control not only Sarajevo, but all of Bosnia. To get the West to intervene, they needed to persuade Western public opinion that the Serbs were aggressors. If you know the history, which most reporters don't know, um, you can very easily see them as the aggressors. And the American press corps, uh, the diplomatic corps, and also the, the foreign correspondents themselves are heavily influenced by what is said and what is done in Washington, D.C. Uh, what the State Department says is the most important thing. In his autobiography, U.S. Secretary of State James Baker says that he instructed his press secretary, Margaret Tutwiler, to help Bosnian Foreign Minister Haris Silajic utilize Western mass media to build support in Europe and North America for the Bosnian cause. But at the Times and the Post, and at the networks, the big TV networks, there was clearly a pro-Bosnian Muslim bias. They were buying much of what the Bosnian Muslims said, and they were egging their reporters on because it made a better story. It's a simpler story if it's a Serb Holocaust against the Muslims than, than, than if, if it is a civil war with atrocities on both sides.
even if, even if we find out when there's a real reckoning of what happened, that a preponderance of, uh, or a higher proportion of the atrocities were committed by the Serbs, it doesn't mean it wasn't a civil war. It doesn't mean that there weren't two sides of the story. This is part of our history, it's part of our culture, it's promoted by uh, the uh, entertainment industry, and uh, so in the scene of Bosnia, we had to have a good guy and a bad guy, and we like to have a victim. So it was very easy there to say, wait a minute, the, the, the Muslims are the victims, the Serbs are the bad guys, and the Croatians are kind of the good guys because they're like us and so on. There was a sense that um, some of their reporting was censored to a certain line which was anti-Serb um, as opposed to actually trying to create balance of what the Bosnians were doing at the same time. The press would have us believe that the Serbs have seized two-thirds of Bosnia. The fact is the Serbs have lived in that territory for 1500 years. Another fact is they are farmers and they are spread all over the landscape so they have always been on two-thirds of the landscape. The statement that has become an absolute cliché that the Serbs have taken over 70% of Bosnia. Again, the underlying assumption is that there were no Serbs in Bosnia before the conflict started, when in reality, uh, uh, much of the land of Bosnia was, was Serb land before the fighting ever began. But uh, the implication is that the Serbs dropped in from some other planet and just took over uh, nearly two-thirds of the country. Based on what he now calls highly biased reporting, Kenny became a hardline critic of the Bosnian Serbs, whom he considered aggressors. In an influential opinion column in the New York Times, Kenny and U.S. Air Force General Michael Dugan argued that Bosnian Serbs should be bombed by NATO. I personally was responsible for perhaps one of the most important things that the State Department did, labeling what was going on ethnic cleansing. I had tried to, to uh, gin up public opinion, uh, in, in, in part of my job was to, to uh, draft material for the, the spokesman, Margaret Totweiler, and she was always looking for inflammatory material. But in any case, my colleague in Belgrade sent me a cable one day saying the Serbs were doing what they described as ethnic cleansing. I thought, okay, this is great. Um, I'll, I'll put this into Margaret Totweiler's noon briefing. And to my surprise, no Women senior official took the words Boston. out. The aggressors and extremists pursue a policy, a vile policy of ethnic cleansing. From that point on, the term ethnic cleansing entered public discourse, but it was not in use before. And I think that that image somehow stuck. And then uh, further down the road, people tried to convert that into an image of genocide, which doesn't really correspond to reality. The reality was that all sides had been carrying out ethnic cleansing since the beginning of the war. And there's ample evidence that there's, uh, that's going on in all sides. It's going on in the United Nations protected areas. It's going on in the areas of Bosnia. Media perceptions influenced policies in Western countries towards Bosnia in ways that widened and prolonged the conflict. The one force capable of keeping order in Bosnia might have been the Yugoslav army, based in Sarajevo, which had the officers, men, and equipment to counter the many militias, Serb, Muslim, and Croat, that formed in the spring of 1992. General Kadijevic tried to do just that in meetings with leaders of all sides. However, under the threat of sanctions and pressed by the U.S., the JNA was forced to demobilize. In Sarajevo, most of the heavy weapons fell into the hands of Serbian forces, while in other areas, Croats and Muslims inherited JNA weapons in armament factories. Instead of a standing army which could be held accountable for keeping order, a lightly armed force of UN peacekeepers was given the nearly impossible mandate of separating the warring sides. UN General Louis Mackenzie criticized Serbian forces for their use of heavy artillery in areas of Sarajevo, but he also wrote later that most of the 19 ceasefires he had negotiated were broken by Muslim forces because their policy was and is to force the West to intervene. There was a, an obvious short-term advantage in perpetuating the fighting in some areas in order to encourage the world to intervene. I don't, I don't think that's an illogical deduction at all, and I think most people would agree with that. The fighting in Sarajevo was described by news organizations as a siege, but the reality was that of a divided city with front lines that changed little in the course of the war.
Serbs fired from areas they held into areas controlled by Muslims, while Muslim forces fired into areas controlled by Serbs. And I think people don't really understand that, in fact, Serbian community in Bosnia suffered uh, in, in exactly the same way that, that the other two communities suffered. Veteran military correspondents, such as Colonel David Hackworth of Newsweek, observed that with 300 tanks at their disposal, quote, taking out Sarajevo would be easier than sliding down a greased pole. General McKenzie agreed that the Serbs could have captured the city in a matter of days early in the war, if that had been their intention. Bearing in mind the ex JNA equipment that was there, and the, uh, as admitted by the presidential side, the overwhelming uh, superiority, uh, superiority in gunnery and in tanks that was available in Lukovica, then certainly a very uh, a formidable assault could be made against the city with a fairly good chance of success. Many observers wondered why a government under siege would shell its own airport. On several occasions, the UN documented and reported and made clear publicly two or three days later that there were cases where the Bosnians had been mortaring into areas where you wouldn't expect them to be mortaring, like the airport. In his book, Balkan Odyssey, Lord Owen wrote that Muslim forces, quote, would from time to time shell the airport to stop relief flights, to focus world attention on Sarajevo. Sarajevo became, after all, a sort of icon of the problems of Bosnia because there was a satellite dish which was shipped in very early on in the crisis. It was easy, if you like, to have ready access to the war on a day-by-day, real-time, instant, minute-by-minute basis, if, if possible. And what was going on in Sarajevo was somewhat posturing for the international media. Whether we like it or not, the presence of CNN, ITV, BBC, and, uh, and the Sky News Network and many others it was an intimidating factor for any military operation going on in Sarajevo that would be seen by the world and the world would pass judgment based on what was going on in Sarajevo. As a soldier, it probably made a lot of sense to tie up the media in Sarajevo and then whatever your objectives were in the rest of Bosnia could be done without the presence of the media. The first serious atrocities in Bosnia took place outside the capital before fighting in Sarajevo began. The first massacre of the war, which was carried out on March 26th in Sijekovac near Bosanski Brod in northern Bosnia, was ignored by Western news organizations. Interestingly, the slaughter of five Serbian families and the burning of the village by Croatian forces was reported by the pro-government Sarajevo newspaper Oslobodzenje. A week later, on April 2nd, Croatian forces captured the town of Kupres in central Bosnia. After the town was recaptured, Serbian television offered footage of Serbian soldiers and civilians who had been mutilated to Eurovision in Geneva for worldwide transmission. But they were turned down by officials in Geneva who said they already had the story from the Croatians. The Serbs have been fragmented in their response to the media. Uh, they were hampered uh, in the first instance by the fact that the television uplinks were in Sarajevo and Zagreb and they were not able to get their message out in the first stages of the breakup of Yugoslavia. But since then they were slow to learn how to use the Western media. In a murky, complicated, uh, violent situation, it's a lot easier for a lazy reporter or a lazy editor to get it from the, from the press agents. And the Bosnians had a better press operation, pure and simple. Reports of Serbian atrocities in cities such as Priedor in northern Bosnia and Zvornik on the Drina River were broadcast repeatedly in Western countries. Meanwhile, the Serbian population of Mostar, the capital of Herzegovina, was virtually eliminated in violent attacks by combined Muslim and Croatian forces in June of 1992. But with the exception of the British Guardian, this event went unnoticed in the West. Mostar presented an enormous problem because it was even more dangerous than Sarajevo. In fact, there are many in the United Nations and those observers within Bosnia who say that the situation in Mostar was far worse than Sarajevo, if that's possible. It almost seems hard to imagine. Some of the worst atrocities were undertaken by Muslim paramilitary units in eastern Bosnia against Serbian villages such as Kamenica and Milici. <laughs> <laughs> 
bloody Serbian reprisals in Srebrenica made international headlines in 1995, but for the first three years of the war, Srebrenica was the stronghold of Muslim warlord Nasser Oric, who drove out the Serbian population and carried out scores of massacres against surrounding villages, including the killing of 500 Serbian civilians on Orthodox Christmas Eve in 1993. Serb public relations was so poor that they didn't weren't they weren't doing what they needed to do to get Serbs on television. Uh, they needed to hire a Washington PR firm the way the Muslims did, or a New York PR firm, and and get their people on the air. They didn't do it. Uh, so partly it's a mechanical failure on the part of the Serbs, but of course partly it's it's a it's a refusal by the networks and by the big newspapers to acknowledge that there was another point of view. Reporters in Bosnia have largely been based in Sarajevo. There's very few that have gone into the Serb areas and spent any time in Serb areas, and that's considerably biased their reporting as well. When news did emerge from the fighting in the Bosnian countryside, it was sometimes dangerously misleading. Brutal conditions in two Serbian-run prison camps, Omarska and Karaterm, were brought to public attention in early August of 1992 by Newsday reporter Roy Gutman. Gutman would later win a Pulitzer Prize for his work. But his use of the term death camps was unjustified in the view of Holocaust historian Simon Wiesenthal and a number of other journalists. When the first stories came out about concentration camps, we really knew no more than, than the press had indicated. But then the State Department didn't make an effort to go and independently verify uh, what it happened. So we were really left with this impression of uh, mass killing, which turns out in retrospect to have been quite incorrect. Roy Gutman's journalistic standards and use of second-hand witnesses was questioned in a well-documented investigative article by journalist Thomas Dijkman in the German publication Die Woche. Much of Gutman's information came from Jadranka Ziegel, a Croatian woman from Priedor. Siegel was an official of a German-based front group for a variety of neo-fascist organizations, including the German Nationalist Party and the present political arm of the old World War II Ustashi. Jadranka Siegel's accounts of rape and mayhem by Bosnian Serb forces attracted much media attention in the West, including from ABC anchorman Peter Jennings. Omarska. There, many of the prisoners were tortured. The women were raped. One of the women was Jadranka Siegel. But crucial details kept changing in her accounts of events at Omarska and Priedor. If you look at um, Roy Goodman's article about her, she blames the camp commander in Omarska, a guy called Zirko Mijaic, as having raped her. And she blames another few, uh, told another few names as well. But in other eyewitness reports, she tells, you know, she accuses different Serbs uh, having raped her in Omaska, which again raises questions about her credibility. It became clear that she tells different stories to different people, and that raises or raised for me quite important questions about the role of the media and the question about the sources you're going to use. The War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague, which investigated these charges, came to a similar conclusion when they declined to use Ziegel to testify on events she claimed to have witnessed. Charges against the commander of Omarska were quietly dropped by the War Crimes Tribunal several years later. Several weeks after Roy Gutman's sensational articles were published, a major interagency intelligence report by the U.S. concluded that while serious abuses had taken place, there was no evidence of organized mass killing. We can be fairly certain that there hasn't been mass killing in the concentration camps. There's just no evidence of that whatsoever. The International Committee of the Red Cross, known as the ICRC, stated officially, quote, Serbs, Croats, and Muslims all run detention camps and must share equal blame. The Muslims were running camps, and the Croats were running camps, and the ICRC in that same week had had a, a delegation going around looking at camps run by all sides, and there were abuses uh, taking place on all sides. Ironically, the first mention of the phrase concentration camp occurred in the New York Times two months earlier, referring to a Muslim-run facility near Konitz. Times reporter John Burns noted that the UN confirmed that Serbian civilians who survived a Muslim massacre 
were being incarcerated in a railroad tunnel. Under international pressure, the two worst prison camps, Omarska and Karaterm, run by the Serbs, were shut down in 1992 after four months of operation. But neither Burns nor any other Western reporters bothered to report on the brutal Muslim camp near Konyets or the Croatian camp Tretel, where killings and atrocities were routine. There were Serbs in camps held even after the end of the war. Um, and uh, there were Serbs being held in, in Sarajevo in horrible conditions in a drain pipe. And journalists knew about it and never wrote about it. There is no use anybody to pretending that there are innocents in this business and that there is one side that is pure white, the victims, and the other side, pure wrong, black, the aggressors. That is not the case. Black, the aggressors. That is not the case. Lord David Owen came to Bosnia-Herzegovina in August of 1992 to replace Lord Carrington as mediator for the European community and with a reputation as a hard-line critic of the Bosnian Serbs. But Owen quickly learned that Muslim forces routinely staged incidents to turn world opinion against the Serbs. Media reports, for instance, had accused the Serbs of targeting Kosovo Hospital in Sarajevo. The UN uh, monitors actually saw a mortar bomb, mortar crew come into the hospital in, in Bosnian government military forces uniform and fire over the Kosovo hospital into an area, presumably Serb. The mortar was packed up very quickly. Television crew arrived, set up in the grounds of the hospital. A few minutes later, retaliatory fire from the place where the mortar came and, of course, landed on or near the hospital, all filmed on television. Owen learned a strongly worded letter had been sent to the government of Alia Izetbegovic by the UN commander in Sarajevo, General Philippe Morillon, stating, quote, I now have concrete evidence from witnesses of this disreputable and cowardly act. I must point out to you the harm that such blatant disregard for the Geneva Convention does to your cause. But there was, in fact, little damage to the Bosnian Muslim cause because the UN did not make the letter public. When I said to General Morion, who's, I think, exceptionally able soldier in every way, well, why don't you make this public? He shrugged his shoulders in a sort of Gallic way, and he said, we have to live here. Such caution was warranted. There were three attempts against the life of General Morion, which he attributed to Muslim forces. In his book, The Fall of Yugoslavia, BBC reporter Misha Glenny observed that the majority of UN and relief workers who had died in the conflict were the victims of the Muslim units. The Bosnian government was quick to understand that most of the world viewed them as innocent victims. Throughout the war, they used this perception to undertake offensive actions and then portray themselves as victims. Lord Owen and UN mediator Cyrus Vance found that their efforts to negotiate a compromise to end the conflict were undermined by the propaganda war that targeted U.S. public opinion. In America, they have a press and a television presentation that is still cowboys and Indians, good and bad. They, they like to see things in simple terms. There's no doubt about that. And it's been helped by some very strongly... Uh, motivated propaganda. It's a propaganda war as well as an actual physical war. And then there were some spectacular um, events which made good television and which were used effectively to totally discredit and demonize the Serbs. Psychological operations and psychological warfare are uh, the uh, dynamic elements of a psychological strategy. Uh, for want of a, of a better word, this is image manipulation of which propaganda is, is, a, is a big part. Uh, you also have agitation propaganda, which involves the actual creation of incidents to get media attention. In the Bosnian capital, Sarajevo, this morning, a moment of terror, just seconds after Serbian mortar shells landed there. The mortar landed within yards of the presidential building where the British Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurd, was having talks. But the mortar shells were not fired by the Serbs. 
French UN soldiers and a Canadian sergeant described the incident to Newsweek's military correspondent, Colonel David Hackworth. The Minister of State for Great Britain was meeting with the, the president of, Ma, uh, of Bosnia, and uh, the minute the, the ceremony was over, they were rushed into a bunker, and it was mortared. And one sergeant said, I was watching the, the, the Muslims dropping the mortar shells down the tube as they were falling on the president, who was safely in a bunker, along with his honor guard. He said, the whole thing was orchestrated. An orchestrated incident could not have happened without the participation of Ali Azadbegovic. Just four days before, on July 13th, a Canadian UN soldier reported a similar staged incident in which a mortar shell killed several children and maimed others. The most important propaganda success for the Izidbegovich government took place on May 27th, just three days before a scheduled vote on sanctions against Serbia. Blood was pouring down the main street of Sarajevo today. At least 20 men, women and children were killed, more than 100 wounded as shells rained down on civilians in the capital of Bosnia. The atrocity by Serbian troops sparked new calls for foreign help for the helpless in Bosnia. Footage of this bloody event from Sarajevo's government-controlled TV station was provided to international news organizations almost immediately after it had happened. Before any investigation had been attempted, Serbs were declared responsible by news organizations from New York to Tokyo. The U.S. government, which was sponsoring a resolution in the U.N. Security Council to impose sanctions on Serbia, was particularly interested in blaming the Serbs. Muslims are being killed in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this government has tried to demonstrate to the Muslim world we care about that and want to try to do something about it. But were the Serbs really responsible? A wealth of evidence suggests otherwise. To begin with, Serb leaders were desperately trying to prevent a vote on sanctions and had persuaded Russian Foreign Minister Andrei Kozirev to negotiate a ceasefire the day before the Breadline Massacre. Indeed, no shelling had been reported that day by the UN until the marketplace explosion. More importantly, the physical evidence failed to confirm the initial reports of a Serbian mortar shell. Dr. Borisha Starovich, the dean of the Sarajevo Medical Faculty, who treated victims of the Breadline Massacre, wrote later in the American journal Chronicles, quote, I found it very odd that there were no lacerations or puncture wounds on any of the victims. Neither were there any head or chest wounds, only trauma to the lower extremities. The wounds were obviously not caused by artillery shells. They were the result of pre-planted demolition charges. A classified report by UN commander Satish Nambiar to UN headquarters in New York, obtained by the London Independent three months later, stated that the Breadline Massacre and a number of other bloody incidents had in fact been linked to Muslim forces loyal to Ali Izetbegovic. Other details confirming a staged incident began to emerge as witnesses came forward. The announcement of free bread had been broadcast five times the previous day on the Muslim radio station Hayat. But when the crowd gathered the following day, they were left waiting for bread that never arrived, while Muslim officials blocked off the street according to witnesses who were standing in the breadline. Witnesses also observed a two-person television crew taking cover in a nearby doorway, the entrance to the publishing company Svetlost just before the explosion in the breadline. They were in position to film the gruesome scene almost immediately. There were suspicions because the media happened to be there. The street had been closed off, then it was open. The breadline formed, and then there was an explosion. In fact, three major staged incidents would take place in marketplaces within a two-block radius of the breadline bombing. Each would affect the international response to the war in Bosnia we've found in, in this particular conflict that these incidents occur invariably before a major decision is due to be made by the United Nations, by the European community, or by uh, within the peace talks and something or something of that nature. So, so what we have is an incident which, uh, in which a number of Muslims get killed, the Serbs are blamed, 
the peace process breaks down. So peace accords are never reached because there is always this incident to break up the momentum. Now, uh, the Serbs have continually got the blame for this. The United Nations has continually responded by saying that these are staged incidents, but the, the United Nations report doesn't get the same impact as the original event. Sanctions against Serbia would have an effect opposite of what the U.S. had hoped. The Bosnian Serbs intensified the war. Despairing of finding a political settlement, and with time working against them, the Bosnian Serbs were encouraged to use their military might to score a quick military victory. Muslim forces, on the other hand, would be encouraged to prolong the war as sanctions wore down the Serbs. Because they had troops on the ground in harm's way, the UN and the European community were anxious to settle the conflict in Bosnia through negotiations that would involve compromise. Serbs would have to give up land they controlled, and the Muslim-dominated government would have to give up their claim to rule the whole of Bosnia. The Van Zoan plan, which was negotiated in December of 1992, would have ended the fighting by an agreement to decentralize power into ten administrative units that would be dominated by the different ethnic factions. Although Radovan Karadzic reluctantly agreed to sign the plan, the Serbs are unhappy with the fact that they were divided into isolated enclaves that would be hard to defend. But it was American opposition to the plan that undermined the UN and European diplomats repeatedly. We were being accused of favoring ethnic cleansing and territorial aggrandizement, and here we were forcing the Serbs back by 39%. Now, I mean, I used to always say, give me an example of a, uh, any plan that has rolled back an undefeated army that amount. If the UN and the European community had been allowed to bring peace to Bosnia, these institutions would have been strengthened. There would have been less need for American influence and an American-dominated NATO. A European settlement of the Bosnian War would have helped Germany and France in their plans for a Western European Union, which would enable Europeans to defend themselves. Vance Owen was not made in the United States of America, it was not made in USA. Uh, that the Clinton administration was coming in fresh with its own agenda and they, the Clinton folks, would decide what was good for Bosnia-Herzegovina, for the Balkans, for the world. Uh, and I think that point of view pervaded the incoming Clinton administration. Domestic politics in the U.S. also played an important role. President Clinton's future rival for the presidency, Senator Robert Dole, had been an early supporter of Croatian, Muslim, and Albanian separatists. I think whatever happens in Bosnia, uh, a large part of the blame is going to be right on the doorstep of this administration, including Secretary Perry. And my view is, when you just write off a nation, uh, it's wrong. The Bosnian Muslims could count on Dole to use his considerable influence to oppose administration policy in Congress. By the spring of 1993, the failure to back the Van Zoan plan led to savage fighting between Croat and Muslim forces in west-central Bosnia. In America, this fighting received little coverage because it did not involve the Serbs or fit into existing media categories of good and evil. Perhaps the most realistic peace plan to end the war was proposed in September of 1993, the Owen Stoltenberg plan, which would have set up three republics on the model of Switzerland. The capital cities of Sarajevo and Mostar would have been placed under UN control. The agreement was ready for the signing when Lord Owen learned that the Americans were encouraging the Muslim faction, headed by Izetbegovic, to hold out for an additional 4% of territory. Under pressure from the State Department's hardline faction, headed by America's UN representative, Madeleine Albright, U.S. Secretary of State Warren Christopher assured Izetbegovic that he had American support in his refusal to sign the agreement. The, the United States clearly sabotaged, to the best of its ability, any European attempts at reaching a negotiated solution. The Americans, not alone, but certainly have been most significant, in my view, of preventing a settlement in the sense that they objected to the particular peace plans thus far. So we have in many ways lost 
opportunity for what would have been good peace plans. In frustration, UN and European community negotiators invited the Americans to join the peace talks, along with representatives of a much weakened Russia, now dependent on Western aid. But bloodshed carried on as the Izetbegovich government continued to reject new peace proposals, despite favorable conditions for the Muslims. After all, with tacit American support, Muslim forces were increasingly receiving illegal arms shipments from Islamic states, particularly Iran, but also Turkey, Malaysia, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia. French UN soldiers reported to Lord Owen that American airdrops of humanitarian supplies in eastern Bosnia were often a cover to provide illegal arms to Muslim forces. Some European community monitors were also used to smuggle weapons. According to the German TV network WDR, one such monitor was Christoph von Betzold, who served as an intelligence agent of the BND directing special operations. One of the largest smuggling operations involved the use of mammoth American-made C-130 transport planes to bring weapons into the airport at Tuzla, another Muslim enclave which was given official status as a UN safe zone. Our supposition was that an arms delivery had taken place and that given the difficulty of the operation and also that uh, jet fighters had also been seen in the vicinity at the time, that the operation probably involved the United States in some way and that at the very least it was probably an American sanctioned operation and indeed that was the gist of our reporting to New York. They were definitely flying in, in uh, small arms ammo, uh, anti-tank weapons and ammo, and, uh, and it was a regular shuttle. Against overwhelming evidence to the contrary from UN and British intelligence sources, US envoy Richard Holbrook denied the involvement of the US in the illegal arms shipments to Muslim forces at the airport in Tuzla. The United States didn't do this, we couldn't have done it, if we did a thing like this, American law would require the president to inform Congress under the covert action notification laws, and it would leak, and it didn't happen. It never happened. If there were planes in Tuzla, and I've heard these same reports, they were certainly not American planes. Holbrook would later deny that the U.S. helped facilitate Iranian arms shipments to Muslims, despite detailed reports on these activities from the Los Angeles Times as well as European papers. The most important weapon for the Izetbegovich government remained the media. The establishment of so-called safe areas for Muslims, including Sarajevo, provided a trigger for Western intervention. There was nothing safe, however, about these areas. The Serbian residents of these enclaves had already been killed or driven off early in the war. Out of a population of 30,000 Serbs in Bihać, only 1,000 remained, according to reports of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Virtually all the Serbs in Gorazde and Srebrenica had been driven off or killed by 1993. Despite the safe zone designation, Muslim civilians could not be protected either because these enclaves were never demilitarized. Indeed, with weapons smuggled in by Americans, Germans, and Islamic countries, local Muslim militias were encouraged to attack surrounding Serbian villages to provoke a counter-response from the Serbs. On February 5th, the Markale marketplace exploded, killing 68 people and injuring several hundred others in downtown Sarajevo. As the dead were being carted away for burial, the crucial question was, who was responsible for this brutal act of terrorism? If the Serbs were responsible, an American-sponsored UN resolution gave NATO the power to bomb Serbian targets. The U.S. State Department was quick to blame the Serbs. Frankly, it is very hard to believe that any country would do this to its own people, and therefore, uh, although we do not know exactly yet what the facts are, it would seem to us that the Serb and the Bosnian Serbs are the ones that uh, probably have a great deal of responsibility. How are you, Mr. Dole? Nice right to see you. Senator Dole put pressure on the Clinton administration to act by declaring the Serbs guilty and visiting the ruined marketplace. 
but both NATO and UN sources obtained evidence that suggested Muslim forces were behind the explosion. General Charles Boyd, who directed NATO's intelligence, concluded that Muslims had staged the incident to force NATO into bombing the Serbs. Sir Michael Rose, the UN's new commander in Sarajevo, reached a similar conclusion. In the report made public, the UN stated that the mortar shell which exploded in the marketplace could have been the responsibility of either Muslim or Serbian forces. In his book, Balkan Odyssey, Lord Owen writes that a senior ballistics expert in Zagreb had studied the likely trajectory of the shell and indicated the trajectory was, quote, more likely to be 1,100 to 2,000 meters from the impact, and this would tend to indicate that the mortar had been fired from a Bosnian government position. I was in receipt of privileged information, really, and I was not going to reveal what was the suspicion, but what I did want was the UN in New York to come under questioning about who was responsible for the bomb. Owen, who was trying to force Serbs and Muslims to agree on a settlement to demilitarize Sarajevo, suppressed the report. He wrote later that the slightest public hint that the Muslims were involved in the Markala marketplace massacre would have led Bosnian government representatives to boycott the negotiations. NATO airstrikes on Serbs were temporarily avoided, but a public which had been kept in the dark about events at the Markala marketplace was left with the impression that the Serbs were guilty. This was a boon to advocates of intervention. Instead of a negotiated settlement to the Bosnian Civil War, hardline members of the Clinton administration began to prepare for a military solution. Even though nobody who really looked closely at Markala uh, from the UN blamed the Serbs, uh, it was automatically uh, subsumed into uh, Serbian atrocities. Using sticks and carrots, a shotgun marriage was arranged between the Croatian forces and the Bosnian Muslims, known as the Croat Muslim Federation. Croatian President Tuđman was promised that he would have American help in his efforts to seize the predominantly Serbian Krajina region, which was part of the UN protected area, a bloody operation that was more than a year away. Croatia would also be given de facto control of Western Herzegovina. Two months after the Markala marketplace explosion, the Bosnian government would have its first success in getting NATO to intervene against Bosnian Serb targets near Gorazde. With help from an American military advisor, Muslim forces launched attacks against six Serbian villages around Gorazde. When Serbian forces responded, American television broadcasts portrayed fighting around Gorazde as if it were an unprovoked attack on a safe zone. The Serbs punished Gorazde throughout the day. At one stage, shells were raining down at the rate of one every 20 seconds. Shells are now dropping at random into the city center. The hospital has taken direct hits on its roof. There was a dramatic transmission from a ham radio operator supposedly based in Gorazde. <laughs> U.S. President Bill Clinton and Bosnian government Vice President Ayub Ganic urged U.N. Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali to authorize airstrikes against the Bosnian Serbs. NATO airplanes did indeed launch a limited airstrike against Serbian targets. But further airstrikes were called off by Commander Michael Rose, who realized that Muslim forces had manipulated UN agencies with false casualty and damage reports. Instead of 2,000 people injured and 700 people killed, fewer than 200 people were injured. Instead of the hospital being destroyed, only one shell had passed through the roof. As he flew by helicopter into Gorazde following the fighting, Rose was asked about U.S. satellite reports that nearly every house in Gorazde was damaged. Yes, practically every house in Gorazde has been damaged, but the most of the damage to Gorazde was done in the fighting that had taken place some two years before, when the Bosnian government uh, forces drove the Serbs from this town. 
and there were 12,500 Serbs at that time living here, and they were all driven off. The, the, the way to distinguish a house that's been damaged by fighting, where a shell has hit it, and a house that's been damaged by ethnic cleansing, is if it's got no roof, no doors, no window frames, and nothing in the house at all, and there are burn marks up it, and bullets sprayed around the walls. That is, the house that's been damaged by ethnic cleansing, a house that's been damaged by shelling, has a shell hole in it, and there are still people trying to live in that um, building with their furniture because they've got nowhere else to go. That's something that you can't see from satellites. And of course, at that time, the international image of what had happened in Garazza was very different from the reality. Um, what was dangerous was that policies were beginning to be put together on both sides of the Atlantic uh, about what we should do in Garazza, but these policies were being put together on totally flawed information. According to respected British military analyst Jonathan Ayal, the ham radio operators whose live reports were carried on American television networks were not even based in Gorazde. During the first year of the Bosnian War, by all accounts the bloodiest period of the conflict, the Bosnian government placed the number of dead at 17,000. Within just two months, however, Bosnian government officials began using a figure of 200,000 killed. This huge increase in deaths came in the dead of winter, when fighting had virtually ceased in the mountainous terrain. I, I'm probably as guilty as most of, of using inflated numbers, although I had enough sense to abandon using numbers in, in mid-93. In a groundbreaking article, which appeared in the New York Times Sunday Magazine in the fall of 1994, George Kenney criticized the way inflated casualty reports were used by most major news organizations. A number of, of very high-profile journalists quickly picked up Bosnian government numbers and began to use them routinely. John Burns of the New York Times, Carol Williams of the LA Times, even John Pomfret of the Post, who's normally a very cautious journalist, got in on this after a certain period. So with these uh, very well-respected journalists saying, okay, there have been 150,000, 250, thousand, two hundred thousand, whatever, people killed, <clears throat> those were the numbers that stuck. While the Bosnian government was using a figure of 200,000 deaths, International Red Cross observers on the ground were coming up with more realistic figures. The, the International Committee of the Red Cross internally, and they've made it very clear that they're not going public with this, but their analysts were quite eager to talk with me and to be straightforward about their analysis. Their numbers are the lowest of any. They say 20 to 30,000 total with an upper limit of 35,000. The figures now, it depends who you want to hear and believe. It's, it's, it's ranging around 300,000. Uh, probably the truth of the matter is you'll be hard pressed to find more than 30,000 graves. It's been exaggerated by that percentage. Now, the, the European military intelligence would say, let's add in every possible hypothetical uh, uh, number of people that could be killed, and they get up to about 60,000. Uh, the U.S. intelligence community was sort of agnostic, saying the tens of thousands, but you know, they, they, they didn't want to commit to any particular number, even, even unofficially. As the U.S. government began to more actively assist Muslim and Croat forces, British intelligence accused the American CIA of doctoring intelligence reports to justify American intervention. The CIA did a report that said 90% of the ethnic cleansing had been done by Serbs in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, we now know that that study was only done in areas now held by Bosnian Serbs. Serbs who were expelled from Muslim and Croat areas were not included in the CIA report even though international agencies stated that 40% of the refugees from the war were Serbian. Unless one assumes that the vast majority of Serb refugees left voluntarily and were not victims of ethnic cleansing, uh, there, there's a very large disparity in the figures. The study itself does not represent what actually happened throughout Bosnia-Herzegovina because it was not done in the other areas. But to acknowledge that ethnic cleansing has taken place uh, on all sides in the struggle would, uh, would muddy the waters. It would uh, cast doubt on the, uh, the status, for example, of the Bosnian Muslims as, as pure victims and the Serbs as pure aggressors. The Bosnian government also used highly inflated numbers for incidents of rape. We are talking about rape camps in which 14 to 30,000 women were raped and are being raped as we speak now. Newsweek reporter Alexandra Stiegelmeyer used the same numbers but acknowledged she had no evidence to back up claims 
that 30 to 50,000 women had been raped in Bosnia. Do you believe the numbers are credible? They seem very high to me. And I don't believe the sources because as I've investigated them, you get them, they always go back to one government or another. A European Community Commission, which estimated that 20,000 women had been raped, dropped this claim from its final reports. After an exhaustive investigation, the UN concluded that 2,400 rapes had been committed by all three sides in the Bosnian conflict. that we should not take sides in this war by becoming a combatant. And we have held firmly to that position and we plan to continue to hold firmly to that position. By the time U.S. Secretary of Defense William Perry testified before Congress in June of 1995 that the U.S. was not taking sides in the Yugoslav conflict, a full range of secret military assistance operations to the Croatian government and Bosnian Muslim forces were already underway. At a remote airfield high in the mountains of the Croatian island of Brač, American intelligence operatives assembled the unmanned aviation vehicles, known as UAVs, for reconnaissance, while Croatian soldiers guarded the airport gates. It was known within the, within the UAV community who they were and, and where they were flying. When you f suddenly ran into roadblocks and couldn't get information anymore, you knew it was the tier one CIA guys that were, that were operating. You could look at truck traffic, you could uh, identify the types of uh, artillery, the types of tanks, their movement. Uh, with this kind of information, you could literally analyze to extremely small detail the, uh, the tactical capability of a, of a force. Only one month before Defense Secretary William Perry testified that the U.S. was not taking sides, a predominantly Serbian civilian area, supposedly under U.N. protection, was suddenly attacked by Croatian forces. Several UN soldiers were killed in what turned out to be a massacre of the Serbian civilian population of Sector West. Thousands of Serbian refugees fled across the Sava River from Croatia into northern Bosnia. Croatian sources put the number of Serbs killed in the attack at 1,000. Serbian Orthodox Church officials stated that 5,000 civilians were killed. But there was no criticism of this atrocity by American officials, including the killing of UN soldiers, because the US was deeply involved in assisting the Croatian military. Efforts by British and French representatives on the UN Security Council to place sanctions against Croatia were repeatedly blocked by America's UN representative, Madeleine Albright. Six months earlier, in November of 1994, the U.S. Departments of State and Defense had approved a contract between a group of retired four-star generals and the Croatian government. Uh, the Croats paid for it, but they were, they were authorized by the Pentagon. I had constant reports of, of American officers who were, quote, retired, no longer in active duty, acting as advisors to the Bosnian government's uh, military, uh, acting as advisors to the Croatian military, and, and they were very active on the ground. The retired generals, described as high-level mercenaries, belonged to a private company known as Military Professional Resources Incorporated, or MPRI. MPRI included such luminaries as Lieutenant General Ed Soyster, former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Major General Richard Griffiths, Deputy Chief of Operations in Central Europe, and most importantly, Carl Vono. General Vono and his colleagues at MPRI would be a major asset to the Croatian army in its efforts to forcibly expel the ethnic Serbian population from the Krajina, which was technically under UN protection in sectors north and south. But the destruction of Sector West, a UN protected area for ethnic Serbs, would have consequences in nearby Bosnia. Lord Owen wrote that by acquiescing in the Croatian government's seizure of Sector West, the U.S. had, quote, 
in effect given the green light to the Bosnian Serbs to attack Srebrenica and Zepa. When Muslim paramilitary leader Nasser Oric launched an attack from Srebrenica against the Serbian village of Visnica, this time the surrounding Serbian forces counterattacked Srebrenica, entering the city. It is well known as, uh, to anybody who, who has followed this that Oric was launching repeated attacks out of a supposedly demilitarized zone against the surrounding Serbian uh, areas uh, around uh, Srebre the Srebrenica enclave. Uh, to the point where, after repeated warnings, the Serbs simply could not allow him to continue to do that and decided to take the town. Oric and several thousand of his soldiers fled across Serbian-held territory to the town of Tuzla several days before Serb forces entered Srebrenica and Zepa. Muslim women and children in Srebrenica were placed on buses by Serbian forces and sent to safety in Tuzla. But between one and two thousand Muslim men were captured by the Serbs, who blamed them for participating in a string of massacres led by Nasser Oric. A Croatian soldier, who claims to have fought with the Bosnian Serbs, testified at The Hague that he took part in the execution of twelve hundred Muslims, although the number of bodies recovered from the site was two hundred. UN Ambassador Madeleine Albright, however, used greatly inflated numbers to describe Serbian reprisals at Srebrenica. According to the International Committee of the Red Cross, thousands of Muslim men, allegedly missing, were found serving in Muslim army units near Tuzla. Washington Post reporter John Pomfret reported that 4,000 armed Muslim soldiers had escaped to a town near Tuzla. Yet these same soldiers were still being included in official reports years later as missing Muslims from Srebrenica. Secretary Albright in particular was very uh, uh, insistent on using such numbers like 8,000, 10,000 uh, Muslim men and boys who were uh, executed uh, in, in Srebrenica by the Serbs. There's simply nothing to document those numbers. But an even bloodier episode, the Croatian army attack on the predominantly Serbian Krajina region, was yet to come. On August 1st, 1995, Croatian troops launched a massive assault on the Serbian population of the Krajina, sectors north and south. It was an operation of about 100,000 Croatian military, yes. Tanks, planes, artillery, the works. While officially denying any involvement in what the Croatians called Operation Storm, American forces were actively supporting this bloody operation of ethnic cleansing. American equipment was used to jam Serbian communications at a critical moment so that uh, command and control, at least in the communications sector, was blocked. And uh, then there was a documented um, pair of raids on uh, Serbian uh, Krajina uh, military facilities by U.S. Navy planes flying out of Aviano, uh, which uh, knocked out uh, radar and other facilities. The shelling of Kanin was a deliberate terror bombardment meant to hasten the departure of the remaining Serbs, and it was you know, committed against an unarmed populace. They had street cleaners coming in and removing any evidence of the murders or the, or the vandals, and before they brought the cameras in to show the triumphant return of the Croats into Canaan. So it was all very carefully planned. Having denounced ethnic cleansing, American military planners helped Croatia carry out the largest ethnic cleansing of the war up to that point. It would appear to be the largest single incident uh, if you count people affected in the first few days. It was 170,000 people. That number quickly grew to 200,000 as a river of humanity clogged the roads. Recently retired U.S. General Charles Boyd, deputy commander of NATO, confirmed that the U.S. helped plan and implement the attack. Croatia would not have taken its military offensives uh, that it has taken uh, either in uh, sector west or, or throughout the north and south, uh, throughout the Krajina, without uh, uh, explicit approval of, of, of the U.S. government. Roger Cohen of the New York Times quoted a Croatian military journalist who confirmed that General Vono of MPRI met with his Croatian counterpart repeatedly in the days preceding Operation Storm. 
the tactics that they employed when they attack into the Krohina was exactly the same tactics that were used during Desert Storm. They were American do doctrine, attacking on many fronts uh, with lightning type attacks. And interestingly enough, the Croatian attack was called not Desert Storm, but it was called Storm. The way they deploy and, and employ their forces is a direct reflection of that training. So it's been very effective, and it's uh, it's been very much a part of uh, of the official uh, the official U.S. policy. Canadian UN officers identified an ethnic Albanian commander, Agim Ceku, as responsible for the massacre of Serbian civilians. Our officers, Colonel Leslie, General Foran, that were there on the ground, wanted indictments against the artillery commander in particular the commander of the operation, and even wanted uh, Tujman, the uh, Croatian president, indicted for his role. Emma Bonino, refugee commissioner for the European Union, noted that as many as 10,000 Serbian civilians were missing from the stream of refugees who fled the Croatian attack on the Krajina. Many of these ended up in mass graves. When you go to the villages, you will see uh, on the cemeteries, the graves without any names. Mostly, it's 90%. Sometimes when I'm thinking about what happened there, I think also about the role of the Americans in preparing of our army. So I really don't know how they educate our soldiers, but if it is the education for democracy, they educate very bad. Well, I don't think that the American people have drawn that correlation of, of those incredible war crimes that happened recently in the Krahina and the fact that the, the Croatian army was trained and advised by uh, and virtually almost led by uh, former American military leadership. They have in fact been accomplice to a massive ethnic cleansing of Serbs from Croatia who had lived there for many, many centuries. It was their home. I think we need to, to step back and, and be representative of principle um, because we only, not only deny our own principles that way, but we create more problems than we solve. Three State Department sources told former New York Times reporter David Binder that the green light to undertake Operation Storm came from U.S. Envoy Richard Holbrook, who flew to Zagreb to meet with Croatian President Franjo Tuđman two days before the attack. At first, Holbrook insisted that he try to prevent Operation Storm, but in his memoir of the Dayton negotiations, Holbrook acknowledged that he encouraged Operation Storm, which drove ethnic Serbs from their homes in the Krajina. Read Holbrook's memoirs. He writes he was encouraging the Croatian government in every way he could to move fast and hard to get them out. Having blocked UN and European peace agreements to end the fighting in Bosnia, the Clinton administration encouraged a joint military offensive by Muslim and Croat forces in western Bosnia. Like Operation Storm, the offensive was designed to force Serbian civilians from their homes, the very ethnic cleansing the administration had once denounced. In his book, To End a War, Richard Holbrook writes that he even advised Croatian forces which Bosnian Serb cities to attack. Those attacks produced nearly as many refugees as Operation Storm, and an unknown number of mass graves in western Bosnia. The following year, after the Dayton Accords were signed, a mass grave of Serbian civilians at Mirkonitsgrad was unearthed. At the time of its discovery in 1996, it was the largest mass grave the war had produced in Bosnia. With Muslims and Croats on the offensive in Bosnia during the summer and fall of 1995, the U.S. military began to intervene openly against the Serbs. All that was needed was an incident in one of the safe zones. On August 28, 1995, yet another explosion occurred in the Markale marketplace in Sarajevo, killing scores of innocents and providing a pretext for NATO bombing. According to the London Times, French and British investigators determined that the shell came from Muslim-held positions in Sarajevo, but this time an American officer overruled their finding. Now what's significant at this time is exactly at the, within hours after this, NATO, this incredible air armada that was 
pulled back, cocked, locked, ready to go. The minute this it was like it was orchestrated and part of a play. This mighty arm of NATO air launched forward and started attacking Serbian positions. They were waiting for that very excuse. I have studied uh, Markala I and Markala II uh, for a long time and at the scene, and I've talked to a number of people who were involved in the investigations of both, and I am completely persuaded that those uh, two explosions were caused by Muslim forces. Bypassing the UN Security Council, which had the legal authority to act in Bosnia, the US had already picked out Bosnian Serb targets, some of them supplied by Muslim commanders. We entered a war, took the side of the Muslims, and became their air force, bombing the Serbs uh, on this supposed uh, atrocity created by the Serbs, where everyone that was on the ground said it was created by the Muslims, which, by the way, is the oldest trick of war. And we fell for it. Selective media coverage of the war had created tolerance, if not enthusiasm, for U.S. military intervention from the American public. What amazed me was that American doves, liberals, my allies from the anti-Vietnam days, uh, the sort of people I thought I could count on to oppose reckless American military intervention, were all screaming for military intervention. They were the biggest hawks of all. For the Clinton administration, intervention in Bosnia represented a chance to justify the continuation of NATO and American dominance in Europe. And NATO's great problem in the uh, early 1990s was simply that the mission for which it was designed had come to an end. It was designed to protect Western Europe from an aggressively expansionist Soviet Union. The logic would go, you've got to expand NATO, and the only reason to keep and expand NATO is to have a mission. Where is a mission? Bosnia, uh, Balkans. The Balkans have become hostage to an American power concept, which is uh, to keep Europe down and America up. NATO was designed to protect the territory of its member states from a major mutual security threat. It was not designed to intervene to project force into a civil war outside the NATO treaty area, and yet that is what it has sought to do as an agent of the United Nations to complicate matters even further in the former Yugoslavia. Not surprisingly, this has not worked out very well. Senior military officers were amongst those most wary of administration policy. I think the mess we have today is a result of political errors. I think we were all too quick to recognize these individual republics as they declared their independence and, and asked for recognition. We failed to uh, think through the history of this region. And so it's a, little, it's a little strained to have that political context and then ask the military to go solve the problem. We encouraged nationalism. We encouraged in the, in the guise of self-determination. We never said to countries uh, or to ethnic groups around the world that it's useful to have an idea larger than yourself or than your own language or your own religion in organizing a government. Because the Dayton Agreement was achieved literally at the point of a gun, rather than by genuine compromise, it was inherently unstable, dependent on outside force to keep the Bosnian Serb and Muslim Croat republics from colliding under a central government dominated by Alija Izetbegovic. To win the backing of Congress for deployment of U.S. forces in Bosnia in December of 1995, President Clinton promised that the troops would be back by December 1996, a month after his election. But four years after their deployment, U.S. troops remain in Bosnia. NATO is an, is an army of occupation, very much an army of occupation. Uh, it's not a peacekeeping force, it's an occupying force. Ninety percent of the financial aid went to the Muslim Croat entity. Serbs were singled out by the International War Crimes Tribunal, whose staff was dominated by Americans. Yet, by the end of the war in Bosnia, a survey conducted by the U.S. Information Agency of Serbs, Muslims, and Croats reported that on a percentage basis, Serbs were more likely to have lost a family member during the conflict than either Croats or Muslims.
The tribunal was controversial among legal experts from the outside because it was set up under the UN Security Council where permanent members such as the US, England and Russia could use their veto power to block investigations of their own military activities or those of their client states. An international court, illegal in its conception. The Security Council has no authority under the UN Charter to create a criminal court. There would never been a UN if it had tried to establish that authority because none of the powers in World War II would have abided by it for a moment. But the United States, in its endeavor, because it was the, it was the country that pushed for the, for the establishment of the uh, tribunal. Madeleine Albright, then Ambassador Albright, was the single person most responsible, without any question, for the setting up for the establishment of the tribunal. Madeleine Albright, who would soon become U.S. Secretary of State, had repeatedly used the threat of a veto in the UN Security Council to block resolutions condemning Muslim and Croat atrocities. I think it's clear that Madeleine Albright has not been impartial in her treatment of this war. Uh, she's been extremely one-sided and in fact uh, so too have a number of people within the US administration. It's very clear that the United States was taking sides, that it was attempting to punish and criticize Serbs in Croatia and in Bosnia for activities that it did not punish Croats for. There have been complaints on the Serb side that we were, we were less uh, uh, efficient in investigating uh, uh, war crimes committed against Serbs, which undoubtedly happened. One of, one of the reasons it was difficult was the non-cooperation from, from the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. But critics say that the War Crimes Tribunal failed to investigate well-documented reports by both the Yugoslav State Commission on War Crimes and independent human rights groups. They've put in, an excessive emphasis on crimes against the Muslims and have been less willing than they should have been to accept evidence coming in from the Serbian side of atrocities against the Serbs. In the eyes of some experts in international law, the tribunal used a double standard when it indicted Bosnian Serb leaders Radovan Karadzic and General Ratko Mladic for abuses committed by soldiers in the field, while failing to hold Muslim and Croat leaders, such as Alija Izetbegovic and Franja Tujman, accountable for similar abuses by soldiers under their command. In its first four years of existence, the ad hoc tribunal did little to prosecute well-documented atrocities by Muslim and Croat forces. No indictments were issued for Tomislav Merchep and Bronimir Glavash, who had been identified by Croatian police reports as leaders of death squads. Merchep serves as mayor of Vukovar, and Glavash became the mayor of Osijek. Nasser Oric, the Muslim paramilitary leader who initiated the cycle of violence and retribution around Srebrenica, now runs a disco in Tuzla. In March of 1999, Investigators for the tribunal recommended indictments for three generals who, four years earlier, had planned the bloody Operation Storm. But no indictments were issued against the American generals who advised them. According to New York Times reporter Raymond Bonner, the Pentagon refused to provide crucial evidence, aerial photos related to the targeting of Serbian civilians in the town of Knin and no indictment was announced by the tribunal against the man who conducted the bloody artillery barrage against civilians in Operation Storm, General Agim Ceku, an ethnic Albanian who had served the Croatian army as commander of artillery. Ceku, who was linked to other bloody massacres in Krajina, would soon take a leading role in a new conflict, a war in the Serbian province of Kosovo. The Dayton Accords, which finally halted fighting in Bosnia, significantly changed the power base of Serbian President Milosevic. Because the provisions of the Accord were unpopular among Serbs, the United States depended on Milosevic to enforce it. In turn, because of his increasing unpopularity in Serbia, Milosevic looked to his new working relationship with the United States to bolster his stature. This was the first time the Americans were overtly getting involved into the whole Bosnia Balkan situation, putting forward their troops in, in NATO into the region. They wanted it to work, and at the same time, um, the Serbs at home deeply resented Milosevic's policies. It had cost them 
West Slavonia, it cost them the Ukraine, it cost them a third of Bosnia. They had thousands of soldiers and, and, and citizens dead. Their economy was in ruins. They had the sanctions against them, and they blamed Milosevic, who had proclaimed he could protect them or would, would do great things for them. Of course, he had been defeated, and they were protesting in the hundreds of thousands in the streets against his leadership and against his presidency. For once, quarreling members of Serbia's political opposition put aside their differences and managed to win local elections in key cities, including Belgrade, Nish, and Novi Sad. They were ready to take on Milosevic in the upcoming campaign for the presidency of Serbia. And at that time, they were looking eagerly for some sort of sign from the Americans um, to, to, to be able to push this over the edge, and they didn't get it. In fact, unlike European governments, which were shunning Milosevic, the U.S. sent two high-level missions to help bolster his stature as the guarantor of the Dayton Accords. Both Madeleine Albright, who had been promoted to Secretary of State, and Richard Holbrook made official visits to Milosevic in Belgrade. When Milosevic manipulated election rules to guarantee his re-election, the opposition called a boycott. Richard Holbrook, however, denounced the boycott, and eventually it fizzled. It was not the first time Milosevic used his presumed adversaries to help him maintain power. As early as 1992, during the Bosnian conflict, the U.S. cleared the way for Milan Panic, an American businessman of Yugoslav origin, to serve as Yugoslav Prime Minister. As Prime Minister, Panic quickly offered major concessions on policies towards the Bosnian conflict and began a dialogue with moderate Kosovo-Albanian leader Ibrahim Rugova. When Panic decided to challenge Milosevic for the presidency of Serbia, however, the Kosovo Albanians, who held the balance of power, continued to boycott Serbian elections, which left Milosevic in power, a convenient adversary in their goal of a separate state for Kosovo. The democracy in Serbia would be set back again, and Albanian moderates such as Rugova would soon lose out to an increasingly violent organization known as the KLA. The uh, German Secret Service played a very important role later in uh, uh, supporting the terrorist groups in uh, Serbia. German BND operatives trained KLA troops, picked their officers, and provided them with an arsenal of ammunition. In April of 1996, the KLA announced itself to the world through a series of assassinations of civilians and police in Kosovo. Inside Kosovo, they clearly represented a, a modest-sized minority, I would estimate no more than 15 to 20 percent of the Kosovo Albanians supported the KLA. But they have international roots in Europe and America as well as in Albania and over the years had developed funding, gathered arms, and they were not necessarily just attacking Serb police. They were killing civilian Albanians who did not support uh, independence. Uh, they may have supported the government or they may have supported Mr. Rugova's pacifist faction. They also were terrorizing the other ethnic minorities of Kosovo, the, the Gypsies, the Turks, the Gorani, Slavic Muslims, and others. They did this before the war, during the NATO air war, and they've been doing it again since the air war, nonstop. After two years of terrorist incidents, the KLA was able to draw an armed response from the Milosevic government against KLA strongholds. As in the previous Yugoslav conflicts, the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights would later report that human rights abuses were widespread on all sides, but both the media coverage and US government spokespersons focused their criticism on the Milosevic government. It is clear that no matter who was in government, the nature of this terrorist war conducted by the KLA was guaranteed to generate a strong police reaction. Ruder Finn, which had profited handsomely by its wartime experience with Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, was chosen to handle public relations for the Kosovo Albanians. By the middle of 1998, as NATO approached its 50th anniversary without a clear direction or adversary, U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright was reported to be eager for a confrontation with Milosevic. She pressed President Clinton to bomb the Serbs. So many of these decisions are driven by personalities and by the power struggles that go on within in bureaucracies. Madeleine Albright, who obviously is the first woman Secretary of State, you know, saw, sees herself in, in a role where she has to be remembered as being tough. As Madeleine Albright has said, if you've got all the military power, why not use it? Uh, 
if, if you can bomb and force people uh, to do what you want them to do, why spend months of delicate diplomatic negotiation? Instead, President Clinton sent Richard Holbrook to meet with Slobodan Milosevic and leaders of the KLA, whom U.S. Envoy Robert Gelbard had described as terrorists only a year previously. Under a demilitarization agreement, the OSCE, or Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, was assigned to monitor the agreement. The Serbian army did pull back to their barracks, that there was a de-escalation in the fighting, and there was a rather low-intensity uh, struggle going on there. There was still some uh, outbursts of fighting, primarily instigated by the KLA, but generally speaking that the OSCE monitors did have a settling effect in Kosovo. We had the opportunity, imperfect as it was, to work and to monitor and to seek uh, a rational, uh, logical, civil solution to the problems and the grievances within Kosovo. Kosovo was a political problem that could not be solved by NATO bombers bombing from 23,000 feet. This had to be solved through negotiations and diplomacy. The head of the Kosovo OSCE verification mission, William Walker, was a controversial hardline U.S. diplomat who'd been criticized for his cozy relationship with the military government in El Salvador, where he served as ambassador. In Kosovo, his portrayal of a bloody battle at Rachak as a massacre became the justification of the NATO bombing campaign against Yugoslavia. If you remember Rachak just a few weeks ago, where there were massacres, dozens of people with their throats slit, it has been a systematic uh, uh, expansion of this whole atrocity. We've seen innocent people taken from their homes, forced to kneel in the dirt and sprayed with bullets. Kosovar men dragged from their families, fathers and sons together, lined up and shot in cold blood. Autopsies by three different internationally recognized forensic pathologists told a very different story. None of the victims, who were overwhelmingly men of fighting age, had had their throats slit. None were mutilated. Instead of execution-style killings, the men were shot from different angles. The Italian newspaper Il Manifesto reported that autopsies confirmed the presence of gunpowder on the hands of 37 men, a strong indication that the dead were soldiers killed in a battle, who were later dragged to the site by the KLA, which had contacted Walker. Reporters from Le Monde and from Le Figaro were invited by the Yugoslav army to go into Rachak. They did the morning before the massacre took place, or supposedly took place. There was no one in the village. It was a known KLA village, it had been the subject of uh, U Yugoslav army attacks before. When they went in the morning, there was only one or two very elderly Albanians in the village. But as they approached the middle of the village, the Yugoslav army units became under fire from the hills above. All that day, there was a fierce firefight in the hills. And in the evening, the Yugoslav army pulled out with the two reporters from Le Figaro and Le Monde. The following day, the OSCE with General Walker were invited back to the village and were shown a trench with 45 bodies in it. Uh, now the, f the reporters on the scene said that there was no bloodshed around the trench. There were very few empty shell cases. They became immediately suspicious that this was a setup, that what was in the trench were bodies of the Albanian casualties of the fighting the day before. And they have reported it as such. But General Walker immediately went back and announced to the world that there had been a frightful massacre of Albanians. Ironically, William Walker, who had been accused in the past of covering up massacres by the El Salvador government, was now suspected of transforming the story of a bloody gun battle into a civilian massacre at a crucial time for U.S. and NATO policies in the region. Well, it's very important because I think everybody pretty well agrees that without the Rachak massacre, there would have been no bombing of Yugoslavia. The press coverage of the Rachak incident strengthened the Clinton administration hardliners. Under the threat of bombing, the Serbs were now pressed by Secretary Albright to sign a document drafted by the State Department. This document, known as the Rambouillet Accords, would place NATO troops in Kosovo and effectively permit the Albanian majority to separate from Serbia through a referendum within three years. State Department insiders acknowledged later the Rambouillet Accords were drafted in a way that they expected the Serbs to reject. Publicly, we were seeking an agreement, said State Department Secretary James Rubin, 
but privately we knew the chances of the Serbs agreeing were quite small. To ensure that Serbs would reject the pact and to pave the way for NATO bombing, a new demand, Appendix B, was added by the United States, which gave NATO, quote, free, unrestricted passage, unimpeded access throughout the whole of Yugoslavia, including associated airspace and territorial waters. In other words, an open-ended occupation of the entire Yugoslavia. If we look at the documentation and the ultimatums presented, we know that this was a disingenuous exercise in blunt, brute power. It was never uh, a realistic proposal for peace. There were never accords, they were a diktat that, to which the Yugoslav government nor any other sovereign state could ever agree. The threat of force in negotiations, known as gunboat diplomacy, has been used in the past by major powers including Nazi Germany, but legal experts observe that it was explicitly outlawed by the UN Charter following World War II. The integrity of a sovereign state is not subject to attack by any other country that doesn't like it. You can't threaten it, you can't attack it. Uh, the launching of that kind of attack is aggressive war. My fellow Americans, Today, our armed forces joined our NATO allies in airstrikes against Serbian forces responsible for the brutality in Kosovo. We have acted with resolve. By acting now, we are upholding our values, protecting our interests, and advancing the cause of peace. When the bombing started, I left. I decided that was it. I was getting out. I went back to Washington. I didn't say, I wrote a, a farewell message to colleagues in OHR saying that this was, if, if ever they wanted to unify the, the Serbs in support of Milosevic, they had just done it. By that time, the Yugoslav military prepared itself by deploying its troops in the field, hiding its major supplies, and preparing for a long air campaign, which had been part of their doctrine going back to Tito's falling out with Stalin. This was what they were prepared for, and this is why Yugoslavia, as small a country as it is, could stand up to this concerted aerial onslaught for 79 days. I'm not sure NATO really had a strategy. I think that they had been led to believe that after two or three days of bombing, Milosevic would have caved in, uh, which indicates pretty clearly to me they don't know very much about Serbian history. Many fled the bombing, which pummeled all of Yugoslavia, but was most heavily concentrated on Kosovo. Others fled to avoid the fighting between 40,000 Yugoslav troops and 35,000 fighters aligned with the KLA. After the bombing began, Albanian communities, which were strongholds of the KLA, were targeted by Serbian paramilitaries. I stayed with an Albanian family who had been, at one point they'd left, they'd, they'd, they'd fled their homes. They were in, a, in an entirely Albanian district. They said that it was about four or five days after the bombing started that some Serbian APCs had come up and had, had machine gun strafed the upper stories of the buildings. No one had been hurt because everyone was in the basements and, and from the bombing. Um, and I asked him why, you know, didn't they come door to door? I thought that was the story. And he says, are you kidding? They were petrified. He said the Serbs were petrified of the KLA. Placed on the defensive by images of refugees fleeing, administration spokesmen claimed that they had intelligence from German sources that the Serbian government had planned to expel refugees even if NATO had not bombed and that ethnic cleansing had been going on all along. We were all told that Operation Horseshoe was in the wind and that this had all been planned long before NATO bombing. After the war, however, German Brigadier General Heinz Lokai revealed that Operation Horseshoe was a sham. No such operation ever existed, he told the Sunday Times of London. OSCE monitors also discounted claims that ethnic cleansing had been going on before the bombing. This notion of, of the justification of a war for humanitarian reasons is just blatantly false. The uh, United Nations uh, Commission for Human Rights uh, recorded their first external refugee on, on March the 28th, three days after the air war started. To protect their own pilots from casualties, NATO bombing took place at high speeds and high altitudes. This politically motivated strategy posed little threat to the Yugoslav military, but NATO bombs dropped from high altitudes would kill hundreds of civilians, including Albanian refugees in Jakovica and Korisha. <laughs>
At first, the U.S. Department of Defense tried to blame the Serbs, but reporters on the scene found cluster bomb fragments with British markings. The claim that NATO was targeting only military facilities was one of many falsehoods that were used to build public support for the bombing campaign. They ran out of military targets within the first couple of weeks. And, uh, I mean, this is now common knowledge that NATO indeed expanded their targets uh, to stage three, which was civilian targets. They ran out of targets. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been hitting little bridges across rivers in Serbia on a Sunday afternoon or hitting marketplaces in Niš. The plan was to first put pressure on the population and second, to, to destroy uh, Yugoslav economy so deeply so uh, intensively that uh, Yugoslavia would have to bear for, for a long period of time to recover. And that it could recover only uh, on the help from outside. NATO bombs and missiles struck the foundations of the country's economy, destroying petroleum refineries and chemical and heating plants. These attacks left a trail of environmental devastation. The use of cluster bombs dropped from high altitudes in civilian areas had devastating consequences in population centers such as Niš in southern Serbia and Pristina, the capital of Kosovo. I mean, I know there was a proliferation of cluster bombs used against Pristina, and there was all kinds of these empty casings that showed still, still clearly the American markings. Scores of schools, hospitals, and apartment buildings were hit in what NATO described as accidents of war, but which were the predictable result of NATO's strategy of high-altitude bombing. Military experts say the methodic destruction by NATO bombs of a full passenger train clearly crossed the line between legal and illegal warfare. The pilot had hit the wiring which had immobilized the train, so it was a sitting duck, made a second pass, and it deliberately attacked the jammed passenger cars and, and basically murdered unarmed people. They weren't just targeting his military targets. When they're starting to take out police buildings in Belgrade, foreign affairs ministry in Belgrade, the TV stations. Sixteen people were killed when the radio and TV Serbia television station was struck by NATO cruise missiles. They killed several technicians and cameramen and a makeup artist. Her hands were found over a hundred yards away in a park. Two people there, and this was late at night, uh, were vaporized. None of their remains have ever been found. A variety of reasons were given for destroying the civilian target, but NATO officials were clearly concerned when radio and television Serbia permitted international news media, such as CNN and CBS, to broadcast images of other civilian casualties to the U.S. and NATO countries. When they began to make journalists a legitimate target, it became, you know, truly an information war. It was after that bomb that Yugoslavia allowed more reporters in and started to get more of the story out from its point of view, but it's also after that bombing that uh, the International Criminal Tribunal issued its uh, war crimes indictments against Mr. Milosevic and other key officials in the government. Although the ad hoc war crimes tribunal is prohibited from taking instructions from individual governments, following a meeting with President Clinton, the tribunal's prosecutor, Louise Arbor, announced an indictment against President Milosevic and his military leaders. The timing of the indictment was controversial because the war still raged and there was little opportunity to gather reliable evidence. The whole act was a very political one because no, nobody really uh, could expect that uh, um, Milosevic uh, could be brought uh, before, before court. So it was nothing else than uh, propaganda again and to enhance the pressure on Yugoslavia and to influence public opinion. It will help to deter future war crimes by establishing that those who give orders will be held accountable. Would NATO leaders also be held accountable for violations of international law? Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights charged that NATO bombing had violated international law. According to Human Rights Watch, at least half the 500 civilian deaths attributed to NATO bombing could be considered war crimes. The attack by a coalition of parties led by the United States, to me, is outright aggression. The Yugoslavs, the Serbs in particular, did not attack any NATO country whatever and didn't threaten any of them. 
they decided they were going to change policies in Yugoslavia and did it by military means. That is the first war crime. Second, in the bombing, although they were fairly cautious for the first couple of days in the targets they selected, ultimately they selected widespread non-military targets. But the ad hoc Yugoslavia tribunal, largely funded and staffed by NATO countries, failed to conduct a formal investigation of NATO actions. Carla Del Ponte, the current prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal, has been forced to review some evidence and has come out with a finding that dismisses any further investigations for now. But the pressure has not been concerted because, again, this was a conspiracy of 19 NATO governments to bomb. And those governments are very like-minded. They know they have violated international law, but as long as they all stick together, they can maintain the appearance that they were, they were doing this for truth and justice. Bombs aside, the NATO war on Yugoslavia was also a war of words and numbers. I think there's no doubt that our political leaders lied to us. President Clinton, Prime Minister Tony Blair were all talking about genocide taking place in Kosovo. Even by NATO's own figures, prior to the bombing, they estimated that there were a total of 2,000 casualties in Kosovo, Serbs and Albanians, which isn't, unfortunately, when we're talking figures of people being killed, they're all bad, but 2,000 is a pretty low intense intensity figure. The, the exaggeration of the figures continued during the war as a justification for the bombing. We had a soccer stadium story right at the end of March, about the 30th or 31st. It was alleged that 100,000 Albanian men were already missing, that they'd been jammed by the thousands into the soccer stadium at Pristina, and a variation of the story reported over 5,000 in another soccer stadium in Petsch. An Agence France Press reporter who managed to stay in Yugoslavia actually went the following day to the Pristina soccer stadium, found the infield grass in perfect condition, found the lone caretaker uh, there who confirmed, of course, the place had been empty since before the bombing began. NATO spokespersons announced that Albanian moderate Ibrahim Rugova and four other top Albanian officials had been executed by the Serbs. Reliable sources report that, and you'll have to excuse my pronunciation, Firmi Agani, a member of the Kosovo Albanian delegation at Rambui, principal Rugova advisor and peace negotiator over much of the past year, was executed on Sunday. All were still alive, however. Rugova was soon shown on Serbian television in discussions with Serbian President Milosevic. The Western public were told that we were, we were bombing in the name of humanity, that we had to stop genocide. But after the Serb army pulled out of Kosovo and uh, the forensic teams were the first to rush in, uh, there have been very few bodies found. And we'll never know how many people were killed but the figures that NATO announced were highly exaggerated. Instead of 100,000 dead or missing, after more than a year of digging later, the War Crimes Tribunal found 2,108 bodies, which included combatants and Serbs as well as Kosovar Albanians. Moreover, the total missing, according to the International Committee of the Red Cross, is 3,368, a number which includes all ethnic groups in Kosovo. NATO's intervention ended in June with Kosovo under nominal control of the UN, terms that the Serbs had been willing to give them before the brutal bombing campaign began. The United States was looking to punish Yugoslavia, was, was looking, I believe, to complete the process of wresting Kosovo away. And in the final lesson, 79 days later, they weren't quite able to achieve that objective because Yugoslavia put up too much resistance and there was enough diplomatic support for Yugoslavia among the Russians and Chinese that so far they have been able to obstruct the formal secession of Kosovo from Yugoslavia. Almost a year after the bombing, Newsweek magazine obtained a secret report the U.S. Department of Defense had commissioned, which showed that the number of Yugoslav tanks and artillery destroyed by NATO was only a tiny fraction of the stated claims. Instead of 120 tanks destroyed, there were only 14. Instead of 450 artillery pieces destroyed, there were only 20. Newsweek reporters John Barry and Evan Thomas stated that NATO had been 
quote, terror bombing civilians. Air power, they noted, was effective in the Kosovo war, not against military targets, but against civilian ones. When the war concluded, Serbian units were compelled to leave Kosovo, but the Pentagon permitted armed units of the KLA to enter. There is little doubt that the Pentagon knew that this decision would enable the KLA to attack Serbs and Kosovo's other ethnic minorities. Pentagon briefers sought to prepare public opinion for new atrocities ahead. I don't think that Kosovo is going to be a very happy place for Serbs um, when NATO comes in. Uh, I don't think Serbs will want to stay there. I mean, I fled with Serbian refugees out of Pristina, um, so I know the terror that they felt. I, I was on a bus that ran the gauntlet of, of jeering Albanians. There's seven or eight hundred of them that stoned the bus in full view of, of the British troops um, who, who made no attempt to intervene whatsoever. Under pressure from NATO, the UN administrator for Kosovo, Bernard Kuchner, appointed General Agim Cheku, who served as chief of staff of the KLA, to be head of the Kosovo Protection Corps. Cheku had been identified by senior Canadian military officials as a war criminal for his role in massacres in Croatia. The KLA have stated their intention. They want an ethnically pure Albanian Kosovo. And if they're in charge of the security force, there's no question that there's going to be reprisals. There is reprisals. And that the head of this organization has proven himself to be a, a mass murderer. What we see as the outcome is the KLA has managed to chase tens of thousands of gypsies out. The last Jews in Kosovo left very quickly. The Croatians have left, uh, they being Catholic. Slavic Muslims and Turks uh, are being chased out. And what it really is, is anybody who speaks Serb is either murdered or chased out. And uh, everybody now understands this. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees reported that in January alone, a thousand Turks and Gorani Muslims had to leave their homes because of KLA terrorism. And the United States has presided over the, most in, the, the erection of the most intolerant society in Europe. The Albanian refugees had returned with a NATO escort following the war, but nearly a year later, a quarter million of Kosovo's minority population had fled, including two-thirds of Kosovo's Serb population. Despite the attacks on minorities, NATO officials, including NATO Commander Wesley Clark, continued to work closely with Hashim Thaci and Agim Ceku. And I think there's no question that, that the Serbs, the Slav Muslims, the Gypsies have been cleansed out of Kosovo. And this has taken place despite the fact that there are 40,000 NATO troops in Kosovo. In an attempt to remove any reminder of the Serbian presence in Kosovo since 700 AD, the KLA has destroyed or damaged 70 churches and monasteries. In one year of occupation by NATO, more religious artifacts were destroyed than under 600 years of Turkish occupation. History is going to have to analyze very carefully the decisions that were made in leading us to that, what I consider to be an immoral, illegal, unconstitutional, ineffective, incomprehensible, indefensible policy. By using force and taking sides in an ethnic conflict, NATO had drawn the wrong lessons from earlier conflicts in Bosnia and Croatia. If the uh, Europeans and the Americans at all, the United Nations, had not intervened in Yugoslavia, uh, there would have been far fewer people killed, there would have been far less ethnic cleansing, there would have been some extremely unhappy and dissatisfied people uh, who felt that they had been done out of their country or their livelihood or whatever it might be. But there were going to be a, a very large number of dissatisfied and unhappy people at the end of all this. Uh, and um, perhaps the moral of it all is that you should think very carefully before you intervene in a civil war. I think it's very important for the United States to recognize that in, in ethnic and national, nationalist conflicts that you must, if you want to end wars and stop violence, you must be impartial because then you do not feed by taking one side, you do not feed the nationalist dynamic and you do not lead to peace. I think there's no question that uh, Kosovo was an unnecessary war. Uh, it was an attempt to bomb Yugoslavia into submission. And uh, I think that's what should be of concern to 
all people of the world these days, that uh, we have the United States as a very powerful military force that no longer sees diplomacy and negotiation.